seeing that there is a quorum of the council president i am calling this meeting to order at 6 30 p.m the purpose of the meeting is to hear presentations and discussion on the proposed studio apartment supportive housing at 132 Northampton Road. Before we start the official part of the program, you can't hear back there? Um, okay, so I need to speak directly into the mic. Thank you. Um, th if you need to use the restrooms, they're up one floor or down one floor. There's both men's and women's in both of those. And obviously, the exits from the building and from the room are red, that being straight out, and others leading to them. Uh, we hope you can find seats. If there are seats available next to you, please raise your hand so the people in the back can go to those seats. OK. Um, so this is a little different than our normal setting. It's actually meant to be a conversation of residents about this particular project. But given the somewhat heartfelt and heated feelings that people have, we felt it was important to basically review for you the rules of engagement. These are directly drawn from two different sources, Massachusetts General Law on Open Meeting and the council's adopted rules of procedure. All meeting participants, including counselors, residents, and staff, should confer confine their remarks to the substance of the issue at hand. Partic participants shall avoid discussing personalities and not impugn the motives, character, or integrity of any individual. The council supports the rights of residents to criticize its local government but this should be done appropriately and responsibly with civility and discretion. All participants shall address their remarks to the president and maintain a civil tone. The council welcomes your remarks. Generally, the public shall not be allowed to participate in the deliberations of the council unless we decide otherwise. Those present shall not engage in audible or visible demonstrations of approval or disapproval. Those present shall not conduct themselves in a manner that disturbs or impedes the orderly procedures of the meeting. If that occurs, I have the right to either adjourn the meeting or take a recess. And if it's an individual, I have a right to warn that individual, and if it continues, ask that individual to leave the room. Any member of the public may make an audio or video recording of an open session of a public meeting. However, we need to know now if you are planning to do that, other than obviously Amherst Media. Is there anybody that is planning to record the meeting? Okay, and you are? And behind you? Okay, May, please make a note in the minutes that we have those two individuals recording for their organizations. Are there any other people recording at this time? Please let me know if that changes. Um, we are going to begin with a five minute presentation at most from Nate Buddington, who <coughs> chairs the Community Preservation Act Committee. We're then going on to presentations by Valley CDC about the project. Then there will be a statement from the Affordable Housing Trust by John Hornick, and then statements and presentations by people who are abutters and neighbors. After that, we will review the timeline of what happens after tonight, and we will move on to council clarifying questions. After that, we will have public comment. And I'll describe more about the public comment period when we get to that. So, Nate, we're going to, again, this is different. We want to make sure that both the council and the audience has the ability to hear from the speakers. Thank you. Could everybody hear me? OK. Any better? Yeah. Okay. Lean, lean way in, Nate. Thank you. My name is Nate Buddington. I'm the chair of the CPA committee this year. The current
current makeup of the CPA committee consists of representatives from the Historical Commission, the Housing Authority, the Conservation Commission, LSSC, and the Planning Board, as well as four at-large members. The current committee consists of at least one grandparent, the mother of an infant, residents of South, Central, and North Amherst, an experienced activist, the owner of a small business, retired academics, a regional development expert, a recreation advocate, members who sat on and supported town meeting, and members who voted for a change in town government. There are probably other interesting <coughs> things I could tell you about our members, but as you can see, the CPA committee represents an impressive level of geographical, generational, professional, and political diversity. This year, we added a number of new members, as a number of people had turned out, turned out last year. More than the two previous years I've sat on CPA, this new group did not hesitate to vote no on a proposal that had problematic elements. We had more split votes than I've seen in my short tenure on CPA. We had vigorous discussions about the property tax burden on Amherst residents, whether an affordable housing proposal truly contributed to the affordable housing landscape, whether we should purchase wetlands that can never be developed, whether we should contribute to the Groff Park project for the third year in a row. And there were others. About half of our votes were not unanimous. I've sat on a few committees over the years, but I've seen few that have worked as well as the current CPA. Asking tough questions, thoughtfully listening, communicating with mutual respect, that's how we rolled this year. The Valley CDC project before us tonight received enthusiastic and unanimous support from the CPA committee. The proposal gets to the heart of CPA's affordable housing mission, and it's worth remembering why we have affordable housing as part of the CPA to begin with. A few data points. The National Low Income Housing Coalition found that a renter working 40 hours a week and earning minimum wage can afford a two bedroom apartment without spending nearly half of their income in exactly zero counties nationwide. Baby boomers, boomers are living longer, more independently, and often with no or exhausted retirement funds than in previous generations. They're also more likely than previous generations to be divorced and living alone. The federal government consistently <coughs> subsidizes middle and upper middle class homeowners rather than low income renters, seniors, and the disabled. Annual federal expenditures from the mortgage interest tax deduction dwarfs what the government pays for rental subsidies and public housing. The National Alliance to End Homelessness says that of the approximately 370,000 homeless individuals, precisely the group that will find shelter in this project, only 55% will ever find permanent housing. From the Atlantic Magazine, more than 7 million renter households have a member with a disability. To help those who struggle with mobility, the most common disability challenge, it's important to have step-free entryway, a single floor layout, wide doors and hallways. And for those who are not of average height or use a wheelchair, electrical controls such as light switches should be accessible from lower heights. 1% of rental housing, about 365,000 units nationwide, include all of those, according to the Census Bureau. And the supply of disability accommodating apartments is the slimmest in the Northeast because of the region's buildings are old, meaning that there are a lot of walk-ups and narrow houses. Embedded in these statistics are the folks who will be living in the proposed Valley CDC fully accessible complex. These folks, homeless, low income and single, veterans, people under the care of mental health services, the physically disabled, they're already in our community. Living on the streets, or with friends or family in already cramped apartments or spending half their meager income on inadequate housing. This project will dramatically improve the lives of our most vulnerable neighbors. So we have before us in this proposal a local solution to what is a profound human crisis faced by almost every community in the country. <coughs> we have a good location, and we have the funds, and we have a great organization with a proven track record. Neighbors are asking many thoughtful questions about this project, as any involved citizen should. And we'll hear many of those concerns tonight. But town council needs to do the right thing and approve the CPA expenditure for this project. This project is literally community preservation. And I have confidence that when you vote, you'll show us the best of Amherst. Thank you very much. And just to remind the audience, we are not taking a vote tonight. Um, we're moving on to presentations from Valley CDC, and I believe Laura Baker and Joanne are next.
please identify yourself. Okay. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager from Valley Community Development Corporation. I think the sound is good. What do you folks? All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to be giving a quick overview of the proposed affordable housing development at 132 Northampton Road. I'm going to be moving and speaking quickly because we have limited time. Uh, we did provide handouts of these slides uh, at the table when you come in because they're kind of chock full of information. So. The site location, uh, site is located on Route 9, about halfway between University Drive and the town center. The light green area that you see on the slide is the parcel, which is mostly surrounded by Amherst College Athletic Fields. The gray L shape is the proposed building. Uh, this is our preliminary site plan. Uh, one of our priorities is to keep as much uh, green open space as possible on the site and preserve the current streetscape. Uh, vegetative screening is shown between the Amherst College field and the rear of the building, and more could be added there as needed. Uh, this is our preliminary elevation. Uh, we propose to reuse the existing house and add a large addition. The style is traditional and residential. The building was inspired by some of the residence halls on the Amherst College and Smith College campuses. Uh, there are more plans on display against that wall over there if people want to look uh, after the session. The site characteristics, uh, it's a walkable site, about four-tenths of a mile from town and from bus stops, about six-tenths of a mile from shopping plazas. It's on a major road and public water and sewer. It's a large lot. Abutters include institutional, single-family, and multifamily residences. More than 90% of the housing units along this Route 9 corridor uh, are renter occupied. It is nearby some dense housing uses, including a six unit rental across <coughs> the street that has 14 bedrooms, three residence halls on uh, Route 9 with 18, 27, and 45 bedrooms, respectively, and a 78 unit assisted senior housing development. Uh, there are two comparable properties owned by Valley and Northampton for single adults that are also located on Route 9. Um, all of the four comparable properties owned by Valley and Northampton are in much smaller parcels. Uh, they're built at higher density and located closer to their neighbors. Some have surrounding commercial uses. Uh, compared to Amherst, Northampton has more than twice the land area in commercial use. Uh, in Amherst, primary land, land uses are open space, agricultural, residential, and institutional. Uh, we are proposing 28 small studio apartments. Uh, the tenancy will be a majority of working adults. Uh, the median income per person in Amherst is $20,336. Uh, Valley is proposing to uh, build eight studios for persons earning less than $31,050 and eight studios for persons earning less than $47,900. <coughs> Many current Amherst employees will be income eligible. We would expect equal numbers of male and female applicants and tenants. Additionally, we propose two studios for clients of the Department of Mental Health with incomes below $18,650, and 10 studios with a preference for homeless persons with an income below $18,650. Homeless persons are those who lack adequate permanent affordable housing, and they will come from a variety of walks of life. These 10 studios are not limited to chronically homeless persons, which is defined as those who have long-term or repeated homelessness combined with a serious mental illness, substance use disorder, or disability. Nationally, only 24% of homeless persons meet the definition for chronic homelessness. Of these 10 homeless tenants, we would expect that more would be men than women. Uh, we anticipate an upcoming zoning approval process that will include notification to abutters, multiple public hearings, and a comprehensive review of the proposed development including the site plan, parking, traffic impacts, project scale, building massing and appearance, fire safety, public safety, adequacy of management, capital reserves, and neighbor and abutter concerns. We've identified a number of key concerns from neighbors that seem ripe for ongoing discussion, including public safety, adequacy of proposed tenant services, unit mix in the building, can there be one bedrooms, for example, as well as studios, and neighborhood integration, how could new tenants become connected with other neighbors? 
Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Reno uh, from Valley's Property Management Company, Housing Management Resources, to talk about tenant selection and screening. Good evening. I'm Liz Reno from HMR Properties. Um, I manage about 200 units of affordable housing, um, including the Valley CDC RSROs. Um, HMR in total manages, um, <coughs> excuse me, provides affordable housing for over 8,000 families and individuals up and down the East Coast. We provide high quality affordable housing that strengthens communities. I truly believe that stable housing is the foundation, oh, oh, sorry, a little pregnant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Generating. I truly believe that stable housing is the foundation for growth. Um, it is very difficult to sustain a job or a healthy li lifestyle without stable housing. Tonight, I would like to focus on our SRO sites. My team and I are very lucky to work with this community and help them find homes, affordable homes, in these difficult markets. Our residents come from a lot of different backgrounds. We have a small business owner, proud grandparents who love to show us photos, store clerks, gas station attendants, veterans, domestic violence survivors, a stand-up comedian, artists, musicians, and many fast food workers. <clears throat> Many of my residents make minimum wage, which in Massachusetts today is $12 an hour. We all know that that's not enough. <clears throat> for, those of, uh, for those residents who are lucky enough to have a job that allows them to work 40 hours a week, they will take home $1,800 a month. If you look today on Zillow or Apartment Guide, you could not find a studio or a one bedroom for less than $1,200 without utilities. <clears throat> Making affordable housing complexes like the proposed Valley CDC SRO the only place for these tenants to turn. <clears throat> we have a rigorous screening process at HMR all residents have to pass a credit and criminal check. We also um, make sure that every resident is set up with services um, before, they are before they are accepted. Um, lots of these for, um, residents are formerly homeless. We help them navigate an almost impossible system. Joanne from Valley CDC organizes a service providers meeting which is vital to the success of our residents. We meet quarterly to discuss challenges that residents are facing and make a plan with their providers from, service, <coughs> from organizations like ServiceNet, Elliott Homeless Services, DMH, Veteran Services, CHD, and Elder Services to help our residents meet their needs. I urge you all to give this community a chance. You will be pleasantly surprised. They are lively and fantastic. They do, are not the people that you think that they are. Um, and that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Hi. Um, we wanted to spend about five minutes focusing on a topic that has come up of interest, I think, to people especially who live near this property. Um, it's an analysis of emergency and police call data. So we've heard these concerns from people in Amherst related to emergency services. Will the proposed development use more than typical levels of emergency services? Do the types of emergency services at Properties Valley already own signal tenant activities that might pose a danger to nearby residents? Does the level of use of emergency calls indicate that tenants need additional services? And are emergency calls happening mostly in the evening or in overnight hours? So those were kind of the questions that we were focused on when we started looking at data. Um, 
We looked at the four properties uh, owned by Valley that are most similar to the proposed <laughs> one at 132 Northampton Road. All buildings house single adults and have a mix of low income and homeless persons and Department of Mental Health referred tenants. The time period that we studied uh, were calendar years 2016, 17, and 18. Uh, we primarily chose this period uh, because HMR, where Liz works, uh, was hired in July 2016, and so this period best reflects the management team that's being proposed uh, for 132 Northampton Road, uh, and we wanted full year data to compare to other types of full year data. Is that the time? Good Lord. <laughs> um, we looked at police dispatch calls uh, for citywide for the city of Northampton. Uh, during this period and we found that they average 1.06 calls per person per year. Uh, we know that that number is underreported because they only had posted the most frequent call categories and not 100% of the dispatch calls. <coughs> we do have 100% of the dispatch calls for these four properties um, and that uh, tallied 1.55 calls per tenant per year. So we do know that we're running above the citywide average. Uh, we do note a slight decreasing trend in calls from Valley properties year to year uh, from 2016 to 2018. Um, again, there are copies of these uh, in the back because there's kind of chock full here. Uh, we also looked at 911 calls. So unlike the last slide, which was just police calls, this is fire, uh, police, and EMT calls combined. Uh, we found that there were 2.11 calls per tenant per year from our properties. We looked at a couple of uh, close properties in Amherst, the Arbors, uh, which is a 78 unit senior housing development, which is very near to this site and found that they had 3.35 calls per tenant per year. Um, and then we looked at the Amherst Motel, which is at 408 Northampton Road, and found that they had 1.58 uh, calls per tenant per year. We just kind of wanted to get a sense of what some different and comparable properties might look like. What we were most interested in learning is why our tenants are calling for emergency services. Um, what we learned in general is that often tenant Valley tenants are either victims or witnesses in a crime situation. We found that Valley tenants sometimes use emergency services for non-emergency reasons. Um, so the primary call uh, category is medical and wellness checks, almost a third of calls, followed by noise or disturbance the vast majority being a tenant complaining about another tenant uh, who's within the same building. Uh, warrants and summonses was next. We note that the majority of these call categories are attempts at service um, and not actual service. So a warrant may be, um, a police may come to try to serve a warrant or a summons a number of times before actually reaching the person. Uh, police assistance and services ran a gamut of valley tenants seeking assistance either with unwanted guests a fall from a wheelchair, kind of a wide range of needs. 6% uh, of calls were unrelated to the residential tenants, so they were traffic stops nearby, calls from a commercial tenant who shared the same address, uh, for example. Uh, suspicious and wanted category, majority were Valley tenants reporting someone or something that they thought was suspicious either at a property or in the community. Uh, property lost and stolen, some were people recovering and turning in property to the police, um, and some were reports of lost or stolen property, including a walker, medication, clothes, and one instance of cash. Uh, substance use and related, there were eight uh, instances of intoxication, uh, two were valley tenants reporting other people who were intoxicated, and four were drugs, one suspected, one medical marijuana, and two illegal drugs. Uh, there were elevator and alarm calls, most of them false alarms, some traffic incident, incidents, mostly with valley tenants not in the driver's seat. Um, they're typically uh, pedestrians or bikers. Um, and assault, uh, valley tenants were victims of assault uh, in three cases by people who did not live in our properties and twice uh, tenant, tenant against another tenant. One instance was pushing. Um, most of our uh, tenant conflicts are verbal. We looked especially for calls that might indicate where there was harm to neighbors or illegal drug use because we had heard those concerns um, from neighbors. Uh, we had, again, two calls initiated by neighbors for noise complaints. We didn't find any evidence of harm, bodily harm to neighbors. Uh, we did not find evidence of neighbor property damage or theft from neighbors. 
And again, we found two instances of illegal drugs on the property. Uh, we looked at the time of day for these calls. Uh, we found that the highest call volume was between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. with a peak call time period of 1.30 to 2 p.m. Um, there are calls occurring during the night, but they're not uh, the majority of calls. We asked ourselves, could the call volume be reduced and tenants benefit by on-site staff? And we answered ourselves, yes. Uh, we, we thought about what kinds of emergency calls might be reduced by having staff on site, and these included uh, tenant complaints of noise, one tenant to another, tenant disputes, wellness checks initiated by family or service providers, uh, tenant calls regarding stolen property that turned out to be misplaced, uh, tenant calls about an unknown person, someone they didn't know at the property, uh, various mechanical issues and other non-emergency uh, calls. Uh, I would add that the call data that I've described above is from properties where there is no on-site resident services coordinator and limited property management staff on-site. Uh, the Northampton properties also have higher, a higher concentration of very low income and homeless tenants than is proposed for the site in Amherst. Um, we are working on a service plan for this property. It is a work in progress. Um, the elements that we've identified so far include an on-site resi resident services coordinator approximately 20 hours a week, um, having uh, property management staff on-site approximately 20 hours per week, having uh, contractual arrangements with other community agencies that would serve tenants. Uh, Department of Mental Health referred tenants will receive ongoing regular support services through DMH and homeless tenants who are referred to the property will also have wraparound services provided by a local agency. We'd like to invite up Pamela, who's one of the tenants at our uh, single person building and she wanted to speak about her experience. Hi folks, can you hear me okay? Great. My name is Pamela. I'm 54 years old, born and raised in Western Mass. I grew up in Long Meadow. Uh, in 2002, I moved to downtown Northampton to a small, uh, affordable studio. I lived there for 10 years. Um, I left Northampton. Uh, I've just recently come back about a year and a half ago, and I, I live on, um, excuse me, on Bridge Street, which is up for renovation, and I've currently uh, relocated temporarily to a, a much larger uh, apartment. I'm going back to Bridge Street when it's, when it's renovated. And many of you might ask why. You know, why would, would a, a single woman, 54 years old, want to live in a, a type of building like that? Well, I'll tell you why. It's affordable. It's a community where I feel extremely safe. I, I know there's been some concerns about safety issues, and I can tell you for all the years that, that I've lived in downtown Northampton and in this type of uh, building, you, you tend to form relationships with your, with your neighbors. Um, I wanna add, some of us are in college. Uh, I'll be going back in September to finish another degree. Some of us are artists, um, some people, you know, came from a homeless shelter and are now stable. Um, I just, what, what I've come to learn living in this type of, of situation is it takes a village to have a healthy community. It, it really does, you know, and um, for me, um, for, what, for what I have proposed for my life, I want to live in downtown Northampton, somewhere affordable. If it wasn't for this type of housing, I wouldn't be here, and I don't know where I would be. Um, given the fact that uh, it is affordable for me, it's close to downtown, I can walk, um, and I've formed some bonds with, with people in these buildings <laughs> that even though we're, we're displaced because our building is being renovated, we, we stay in touch. You know, we have a community night where we share meals at each other's homes. Um, you know, we're, we're not out going to bars. We're not out partying. You know, we're, we're talking about our future and we support each other. And I think what I would ask each and every one of you to think about when you think about this type of uh, 
coming, building coming into your community, it's going to benefit your community. Um, and you will be, as Liz said, pleasantly surprised. Um, it'll be people like me, you know? Um, and if, if given a, a chance to, to a, a DV survivor or a recovering addict or a college kid, it gives us some place to go that we can afford. And I think I've heard it said many times, one of the biggest problems we face is affordable, stable housing. And that's what this is. And I'd ask you all just to give it a chance. Thanks. Thank you. We're now going to proceed with John Hornick. My name is John Hornick. I am the chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. On January 10th of this year, the members of the Housing Trust voted unanimously to recommend to the Community Preservation Act Committee that this proposal for Valley Community Development be given its highest priority for funding above both of our own proposals for funds to support future affordable housing projects and those of others. Our recommendations stated in part, to the best of our knowledge, there is no equivalent structure in Amherst, although there are at least four Northampton, in Northampton. According to the Housing Production Plan 2013, there are a large number of individuals who would benefit from this development, much larger than the 28 units can accommodate. Nonetheless, it is a good start and one that this community has been slow to recognize. We applaud the work that Valley Community Development has done to bring this project to its current status. I personally want to thank CPAC for making this recommendation to Town Council. Further, I want to thank Valley Community Development for stepping forward to plan a residence that will address a significant unmet need for housing for low-income persons in Amherst, including some who have recently been homeless. Tonight you will hear from others who share the opinion of the Housing Trust in support of this housing development. During public comment, I expect you will hear from persons living in the immediate neighborhood who support this development, from experts on fair housing questions that are at issues, from people who have direct experience in working with residents, like the, one, like the uh, people who will be in the one proposed and who are confident that future residents do not propose exceptional risks. From people who have lived in or near similar residences and can report positive experiences with those neighbors. From civic organizations and service organizations who support this project. From persons who are knowledgeable about affordable housing development who regard Valley as a competent, well-respected, not-for-profit organization as well as hearing from other advocates for this project, many of whom have written letters to town council, as well as those who are here to speak this evening. I am personally pleased and proud that so many members of the Amherst community have chosen to support this housing project and to do so with conviction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We're now going to move on to statements from the um, what we would refer to as the abutters and neighbors. And I believe we are starting with Stephen George. And Stephen, we have a slide set from you that we're prepared to show over yes, here. Yep. Thank you. President Lynn Griesemer, councilors, neighbors of Butters. Thank you very much for this opportunity. This is an extra workload for you that, uh, in a, when the council already has a full schedule. Thanks also to the town staff who have to be here for this extra meeting. I want to mention Ed, I don't know his last name, but I do several other things in this building and Ed is the person who sets things up. He's been here mm -hmm. every time, no problem. Okay, I live at 23 Dana Street. 
And um, we're going to have five brief speakers. We are not elected by the residents or the abutters, but somehow we are <laughs> called upon to make a presentation that's similar in, in form and length to the presentation you just heard. And I want to thank the people who presented for the tone of that, which was informative and sometimes compelling. And there's not the slightest doubt in any of our minds that everyone involved in promoting the project has the best intentions and wants the project to succeed. And how am I advancing the slides? Or you, you're gonna, you can do it? Okay, next slide. Okay, let me just suggest some goals that I have. To support affordable housing in Amherst and specifically at 132 Northampton Road, the goal is to support it right now. I do not support the, pro the, the proposal there as presented. There is problems with it. A couple of other uh, possible, a couple other goals would be to maintain Amherst's existing community character and to ensure that new development is in accord with existing neighborhood character. The last one has provoked some controversy with people saying this is an illegitimate or reprehensible um, goal. Of course, you can see it comes not from my words, it's from the Amherst Master Plan. The, the, uh, maintaining the existing community is goal number one of that plan. And ensuring that new development is in accord with existing neighborhood character is from that same section of the plan. So there's nothing to apologize for or to be ashamed of in saying this is one thing that we want to address and, be, and consider to maintain the existing neighborhood character to some extent. Of course, there's going to be changes with time. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's talk about what is that existing neighborhood. I'm showing a zoning map here. We're not going to get into the weeds with zoning because it's, I'm not qualified to do it, and it's not the council's main job. But just to show um, roughly where this is, this is the, the site on 132 Northampton Road. This is Northampton Road Route 9 here. The town center, the business district. These are the playing fields of Amherst College. This is the central campus. So these, this site is surrounded by residential zones. The, resi the general residents and the neighborhood residents. The general residents being a higher density, the neighborhood residents being a lower density. And you notice that the site is at the very boundary or limit of the general residence. So it's near a moderate density residential neighborhood. Next slide. Okay, uh, okay so, so um, the, Valley, the Valley CDC says that uh, they want to define the neighborhood as a corridor along Northampton Road. Maybe it would look something like this. Next slide. Okay, some kind of elongated corridor. That's fine, but then most of the people that are here, a lot of them are, would not be in the neighborhood because we live on Dana Street, Blue Hills, Orchard Streets down here, Woodside, and so on. So I think a better idea of the neighborhood is the next slide, which is you know, people that live within, one, within three tenths of a mile of the, of the site. Okay, and so looking at that, we can take that same, uh, that same circle. You might want to go back just to see that it is the same. Okay, but so another view of that, of that area, go to the next one now. That is a, a land use map. So going to the town website and looking at the, the, how each parcel of land is used. Yellow is one family, single family residences. Tan is multiple family. Most are two family residents. Some three, and there's a couple of them. There's 115 Northampton Road there. I think it has, I think it was mentioned, six apartments. 50 Lincoln Avenue has three, and there are a few that have more. But the primary character is one or two family residents. There are some of the par properties on Northampton Road that are rented to students. I think that's why Valley CDC would like to make that because it has a lot of those. But the neighborhood itself is primarily one and two family style structures. There are three other that were mentioned actually in the presentation, three other types of uses that uh, are different from just single family residents, but uh, I, I'm gonna show you the characteristics that they have that I think are relevant. So let's look at the next one. Okay, there are three live-in dorms, Seligman House, Right here is not that far, and two more. But notice that uh, the dorms have, uh, these are Amherst College dorms, they have live-in trained resident counselors, not one per dorm, but one per floor. And so that is a, a way that they're accommodating the neighborhood in a sense by having that degree of support and supervision. There is a boarding house at 71 South Prospect Street. It really is an old-fashioned SRO, not studio apartments, but really just single rooms. 
13 units are, are there. Um, that boarding house has had a live-in building manager. I don't want to overdo it and say I know it has it right now because I'm not positive, but I know the previous building manager. She said it was chaos before she came. Uh, she was an on-site live-in building manager. And of course, the arbors down here, uh, which is an assisted living facility, primarily elderly people. Of course, it has 24-hour professional staff. So uses that are not primarily single family have a degree of support and supervision that is, that is appropriate for the residents and that is, that is reasonable for this kind, of, uh, this kind of neighborhood. Okay, so let's now examine, oh yeah, one other point that's very important. To show the, 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 the family orientation of the neighborhood, um, the, uh, this 500-foot this, uh, circle around the residence houses 21, is it? I think it is 21, 21 children live there, and four grandchildren are often staying there. And then there are an additional at least 40 children living in between the 500-foot circle and the larger one. So there's a lot of kids in the neighborhood. In fact, the number of kids is increasing as there is turnover and new families coming in. Uh, so the increase in kids is, is noteworthy because that's not characteristic of the town as a whole. So this also emphasizes the family, one and two family residential style of the neighborhood. Okay, let's look at the situation with Northampton Road. With, with not Northampton Road, but the Northampton uh, SROs. Three are in frankly business zones and there's just no doubt they're right in the middle of town. Middle of Florence, one is on King Street. One is in urban residential C. That's a different category that we don't have here, but it's the highest density of, uh, of residential. And it's close to downtown, a block from the post office, a block from the PD, PVTA TA stop. So if you look to the distance, at the distance to services that you would have for residents on the one in Bridge Street, Northampton, that's Route 9 as you approach town, the one that's being renovated now, and compare that to the distance from the proposed site here in Amherst to those services, you see that the one in Bridge Street, which is of course the, the most residential, the most urban, the, the least urban of all of them, the distances are much shorter. And why is that? Is it because land is more readily available in downtown or cheaper? Of course not. The reason that the, the SROs are located there is because many of the residents don't have cars and they need access to those services, especially in winter. So the location of those Northampton SROs reflects that. The one in Amherst is not ideal from that point of view. Okay, so the proponents of the current proposal for 132 Northampton Road, they say it represents no change. No, okay, no change, no risk. It's like what we already have. And uh, if the project is built as proposed, we, we suggest that it will be an extreme outlier in the neighborhood compared to everything that's there now. And as the other neighbors will discuss, the Northampton SROs are not free of trouble either. Melissa Porter. Big audience. Um, I'm Melissa Porter, and I uh, live at 110 Dana Street. And I've been working in human services for 32 years, and predominantly with people uh, who are the most marginal or vulnerable, meaning they have co-occurring issues such as substance use, chronic homelessness, and mental health issues. Um, I also have experience running and overseeing and managing two uh, SROs or similar SROs to the, to the project that Valley CDC is proposing. And um, I do have a speaker here tonight who is a friend of mine and volunteered when I kind of talked to him about the proposal. And I think, for one, I am a, uh, I am a major proponent of affordable housing and uh, it is, you know, my life's work. I do have uh, concerns about the current model and the lack of staffing um, that is being uh, proposed. So the person I'm having speaking is Chris, and Chris is gonna come on up here and share his experience about uh, living in an SRO that's very similar to the proposed model in terms of the staffing and some of the issues he had. So come on up here. Awesome. I'm a little short. Good evening. So I'm, 
My name is Chris A. I'm 58 years old, and I've lived in two different SROs in the Valley. Um, I currently don't live in one. Uh, so I've, I think an SRO, this, this type of building, is an amazing opportunity for people to better their lives and to move forward. Um, I was able to do that by living in one. Uh, I lived in one single room occupancy that had uh, the staff that they're proposing here, just somebody who dropped in, uh, that was not the most ideal situation. It was up in Turner's Falls, there was a lot of isolation. Uh, it was not, I don't think it's a good idea, personally. I lived in one where they had a live-in resident uh, who kind of didn't have to pay rent and was keeping an eye on things. Also not an ideal situation because there's a lot of favoritism that can go on. So my, my feeling is that this, like I said, this could be a fantastic opportunity for people to move forward and, you know, rid themselves of homelessness and, and be a productive member of society. But I think having one resident, one manager that lives there is not a good idea. Uh, the burnout, because they would be on call 24 hours. And I don't think that's realistic to have somebody to expect them to be on call 24 hours a day in case there's an emergency, there's crisis. My, my feeling is that having um, a round of employees who come in and work there is a better idea. Uh, just in case, and they need to be trained. Uh, they should have first responder training. They should be trained in dealing with uh, mental health crises. Uh, and also just general upkeep and you know maintenance of the place. Um, I, I just think that that would be a better a better idea to have somebody there all the time. Having uh, one property manager drop in for 20 hours a week, uh, and you know when when I lived in the one up in Turner's, we had that the property manager dropped in once a week. Uh, I got locked out one time, I left my keys inside, and once the door shuts behind you, you're out. And I had to wait a day and a half to get the manager to come in and unlock the door for me. With a live-in, or at least an on-site staff, there wouldn't be any issue with that. And I think a lot of people are worried that there's going to be a lot of people roaming around the neighborhood at night. Uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience that when people have been homeless and they have a place to stay, they're not going to go out at night. <laughs> They've, they've been living outside, and the last place they want to do is to be outside in the cold or in the dark. Uh, they can have a roof over their heads and power, and they're not going to want to go out. So I don't think that's really a, a realistic worry. Um, there's always going to be one or two people that could have issues, but for the most part, my experience has been a good one. Um, most of the residents tend to want to stay inside. They'll go to work. They'll go to their appointments, uh, the ones that are in crisis. That's where that, you know, on-site staff is important. Uh, I witnessed people that were in mental health crisis who were just locked in their rooms and for days before somebody came to check on them. With an on-site staff, that wouldn't be an issue. There would always be somebody there who's trained to be able to handle this and reach out to the appropriate, uh, you know, services. So that's my feeling anyway, and I left my watch at home, so I don't know how long I have. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'll share the time, and like I said, fantastic opportunity if it's just played right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosie Cowell. And we have slides for Rosie. By the, to by the way, all of the material that's presented tonight will be on the website by tomorrow sometime. Thank you to the Town Council. And I'm really glad that this, the title of this session was changed from Neighbours in Opposition, because um, I'm not in opposition to this project in, in whatever form um, it's presented. Before you read too much into my accent, let me share that, that all four of my grandparents didn't finish high school, and three of them left by the age of 14. My granddad was the youngest of 13 kids who grew up in a town, a, a house in East London that had four rooms. And my mum, his daughter, um, grew up in affordable housing. So, if, and I'm, you know, and I'm totally a, benefic a beneficiary of the British welfare state. And I think that my new country, America, should have more welfare state. And I'm in favour of affordable housing. And I'm in favour of affordable housing at this site. 
But I do think there are, um, you know, and something that's really unfortunate that's happened is that it's, it's as though everyone who's in favour of it is here, and if you voice any kind of a concern or criticism, you're like way over here and in opposition. In reality, there's a whole bunch of people who are kind of like here and just want to express concerns about specific aspects of the management plan. And, and that's why I'm up here. Um, we've heard qualitative testimonials about good stuff, and that's great. But I'm a scientist and, and you know, we're being asked to sort of take a lot of um, verbal assurances for things. I prefer to have data if, um, if we can get it. Um, so what we did was try to, like I was just explaining that we have shared goals, what I did was try to get some concrete data on Valley CDC outcomes to figure out if the management plan is really um, adequate. And I'm fully acknowledging this is a mixed income plan. These are the four types of units that Laura has explained she's proposing. I think we can get data from existing Valley CDC properties that kind of inform us about these. So one form of property that was sold in 2013 by Valley matches up with those two sets of units. It's low income apartments. There are three, uh, four existing Valley properties that um, match up, kind of broadly speaking, with those three categories of units in terms of the um, incomes and the circumstances of the residents. Um, so these we can use as kind of a model for what to expect in terms of tenant success and tenant support. This is, so we got the, the call logs, which include police and I think most fire for these residences. Um, what I'm going to show you is the overall call rates. These are going to look a little bit different from Laura's data. We have different data sets. Um, Laura just shared hers with me this evening at half past five. Haven't looked at them yet. I'm very happy to look at hers. The data are going to look different because we we're working with about 13 years worth of data and Laura's only working with about three years worth. Ours include fire calls. I'm not sure whether Laura's... Do I think she presented with and without. Anyway, this is overall call rates excluding motor, which are, could be completely irrelevant, and excluding medical calls because they you know, might represent just the inherent health challenges of some of the tenants. Um, and what I'm showing you is a baseline, which is the rate of calls per resident per year for Amherst. The dark green, that's light green, dark green is the low income apartments. Um, a lot of people have mentioned butternut farms um, in Amherst and cited it as successful. It's possible that dark green bar is a good model for butternut farms and that looks to be correct in the data. There aren't too many calls there. The other four properties, it looks as though there are a much higher volume of emergency calls. Um, so the question is, about, about five times as many as in the town of Amherst, just under five. So the question is, you know, what do, we, what do we make of this? Two things strike me. The first thing is that those call volumes are high. And when we asked Joanne Campbell about call volumes on the 24th of April, she initially said that there, there wouldn't be any emergency calls in a typical week or month. And that worries me because, you know, I think we need to be on top of these metrics. We need to really know what's going on. The second thing that strikes me is I wonder whether the mixed income... Uh, model is going to work out if the if the people who are you know in those um, self pay units are not so, so accustomed to emergency services in the middle of the night. I mean, maybe it'll work out, but we need to sort of consider whether that um, model is going to work. I will say that um, you know I don't know that we can make too much of these overall call rates because they include a ton of stuff that we just don't know what it is. Sometimes those numbers are pushed up by disturbances. Sometimes it's by stuck elevators. So what we did instead was decided to look at individual categories and see whether that can tell us more about the safety. And by the way, two really important things. I'm not doing any of this to stigmatise these tenants, not at all. As Laura said, a lot of the time it's probably events where the tenants are actually victims of the activities that are being logged, right? That's entirely possible. And I'm also not trying to draw any conclusions about impact on the neighbourhood. What these data tell me about for sure is whether the, you know, is a good index of whether the tenants are safe. So when we look at ca individual categories, we have high validity here because we know we're dipping into the call log data for the same exact same call types for the town and for the valley properties. We found 21 categories that we could compare. Of those, 15 were higher in the valley properties than in the town. I'm going to show you 11. I've left out four of them either because they're not very interesting or because they weren't very much higher in valley than in the town. And what I'm showing you is the ratio of calls per resident per year in the valley properties to, to the same number in the town. And what you can see, um, like I said, it's entirely possible most of this is the tenants being victims, like the trespassing is four times higher than in the town. To me that indicates a need for, as Chris was just saying, a need for increased security to, to make sure these people are going to be safe. And the medical emergencies are nine times higher in the, 
in the properties than in the town and that to me makes me think maybe we need to be offering more support to these um, vulnerable individuals. So, um, like I was saying, um, and as, you know, a lot of these categories are things that imply we need to be doing better by these residents. As Chris was saying, we need to make sure that if we're going to welcome new people into our neighbourhood under this model, that we're doing a good job of it. So what I've heard from Melissa and other people with expertise in human services is that we need to be proposing 24-7 on-site management to make sure that we're really doing a good job. Um, I spoke with people who are familiar with this kind of arrangement. It might cost about 150000 a year. We could, there's a number of things we could do. We could ask the developer to revisit the funding plan. We could raise taxes in the town of Amherst. Like I said, I'm from a country that has a better welfare state. I don't think our taxes are that high. I would be fine with raising our taxes to pay for this, to do it properly, rather than do it in a way that might not work. It might, uh, and might not fit in, you know, um, be, be kind of uh, a, a good way for these folks to be integrated into the neighbourhood. Um, we could ask our neighbour Amherst College to contribute to that. So in, in summary, you know, there's a lot of things we can do. I really think that there's a need for this based on these data. I'm very happy to work more with Laura to compare our results with hers and to look also, Laura mentioned time of day. I don't know whether she had the motor calls in her analysis, which might explain why the peak was at 1 p.m., but what I think we want to do is look at those calls that are between 6 p.m. and 9 a.m., figure out what they are. Is it the incidents that are, you know, danger, presenting dangers for the tenants? Do we need to increase safety? Um, and I would ask the town council that we try and get a concrete plan for this in place before the town votes through the $500,000 seal of approval. Otherwise, any leverage to get modifications to this plan is probably going to be lost and we'll just have to, you know, trust the, the current plan, which Chris has indicated he doesn't, he doesn't think is quite enough. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kate Sims. Kate also has slides. Thanks very much. I'm Kate Sims from 77 Dana Street. Thank you to the town council for this chance to speak. As I understand it, this development is meant to contribute to two town goals, reducing homelessness in Amherst and increasing affordable housing. I share those goals, and I also support creating affordable housing at this site. I understand that the town council is under a lot of pressure to pass this proposal without modifications because many people see it as making progress towards those goals. However, I think it's reasonable for us to ask whether this specific design is really the best way to meet those goals. I would like to discuss some financial concerns and propose a concrete solution to move forward at this site. That would be to use the CPA funds to acquire the parcel by the town for affordable housing, but redo the process to include meaningful neighborhood input from the start. The information that I'll present is based on the developer's budget and some communication with Laura. I have sent more details today to the council in a point-by-point -point response, and I ask for that document also to be posted online. The developer's budget includes $407,000 for the site, uh, $407,000 for the site, $3.85 million for the cost to build the building, and about $550,000 in developer fees and overhead. I worry about whether this project is really fiscally responsible for the region and the town. The total development cost is $4.8 million to create 28 units. That's $172,000 per 200 square, 240 square foot unit, or $373 per square foot. Compared to the list price of current housing, that is high. The developer says this is because they're building affordable housing, small units with kitchens and bathrooms, and that they benchmark favorably compared to other properties. But all of the benchmarks that they provided in their application refer to their own properties. As an external benchmark, HUD guidelines give a ceiling for what new affordable housing should cost to build based on actual construction costs from our region. Compared to the 2018 numbers in a building with an elevator for a 500 square foot studio unit in the Springfield region, Valley's costs are still 20 to 30% higher. So given limited state funds for affordable housing, even housing advocates should question whether state funds might be better spent supporting other projects that could build more housing. I also worry about the town's reputation in working with a high cost provider. We will really need the state's goodwill to obtain matching funds for our schools and other capital projects and we need to be careful stewards of the state funds. This development also comes at a high cost to the town. 
Given what we will invest and what we will receive back in taxes in the next 20 years, according to Valley's own numbers, we're paying more than $300,000 to make this happen. This number looks a lot bigger if you try to do a full accounting of costs. These would include the foregone use of that capital for other projects and the loss of our valuable development rights. Remember that this developer is seeking to build at a higher density than is currently allowed. And those rights are held in common by all of us, kind of like the public airwaves. In this deal, we are paying a developer to take those valuable rights. And even though they're nice people, that might still be a bad deal for the town. If the risks of this project materialize, those will also mean extra costs. Additional social services, a change in bus routes, uh, and possibly the loss of public use of Pratfield as a recreation site. Most distressingly, there's no mechanism here to hold the developer accountable if any of those possible future costs do materialize. It will fall on the neighborhood and the town. If we're gonna invest in resources in this proposal, I think we also deserve to take an honest look at what the benefits are. From the letters and comments on the town website, I think many people are expecting this development to make a real impact on homelessness in Amherst. But we do need to remember that realistically this project will house at most seven people from uh, the Amherst community, or four to five percent of people currently experiencing homelessness in Amherst. And that's only if the state agrees to that priority for Amherst residents. Most importantly, this development is designed to serve only individuals who have vouchers to pay for their rent and who pass screening requirements. It will do nothing for the homeless individuals in town who don't pass the screening or don't have vouchers. Also, in terms of affording affordable housing more generally, this will just add a small number of units. Uh, would, uh, our overall needs really hinge on figuring out how to house the population of students. The town's forum on homelessness identified several other solutions to homelessness in our town. In particular, outreach counselors who would work on a case-by-case -case basis were identified as a solution that would have high impact for low cost and be available to all I hope that we can try to come unstuck from the idea that this proposal is the only or necessarily best solution to reach our goals. So how could we find a compromise for this site? Um, whether it's a good use of resources or not, it's true that an SRO project has been in the works for a very long time. But this specific site was only acquired in January. The two closest abutters, who are sitting in the front row here, actually, um, objected immediately to no avail. Details of this proposal were not presented to abutters until April 24th, after key council recommendations were secured, and the notes of the CPAC meeting show that no hard questions were asked about this proposal. Yet our neighborhood will bear all of the risks if this development does not go as planned. Since this time, since details were pre uh, presented, neighbors, including myself, have met with and called Valley CDC and asked directly for changes that might lessen risks. We have asked for 24-hour supervision. We have asked for a smaller scale that would match their past developments, or mixing in family-oriented affordable housing at this site. We have been told that none of these are financially best options for Valley. They say, even tonight, that they're considering changes, but nothing has actually changed about their plan, and it won't, unless the town council acts. I understand that you're in an uncomfortable spot, and you may wish to punt this to the zoning board. But Valley CDC needs this funding to put in a competitive application with the state. If we want modifications to this proposal, this is the moment of leverage. And as much as anything else, this is a key test of process under the new town council. Will outside developers determine the outcomes, or will neighborhoods have a, shay, have a say in shaping developments for the better? I think the best way to go forward immediately with affordable housing at this site is for the town to acquire this parcel using the CPA funds discussed. The town could commit now to developing affordable housing at this site. They could provide a long-term lease to the developer, which is just like the deal happening with the East Street School site. But we would redo this process with meaningful neighborhood input from the start. This has benefits for all. The developer would be relieved of the risk and carrying cost of the structure. They could even pursue other sites closer to public transportation or at larger scale for, to have more staffing. And if this does go forward as planned, there would be no change to their planned budget. Their acquisition costs would be covered, uh, just that that line item would be taken by the town's contribution attached to a specific line item. For the neighbors, this would do a lot to restore trust, give us time to work with the town to improve this proposal. Um, instead of giving away our development rights for free, we would at least get the land as a valuable long-term asset for the town. And this would provide more accountability. 
And finally, the town could commit now to using this site for affordable housing, still making progress towards those important goals. Very last slide, I'd like to share a vision for an alternate plan for this site that might be more cost effective. This parcel has an existing house on it. The current plan is expensive, partly because it tries to incorporate that structure into the new one. It would be much more cost effective to use that house as it stands, then build a two or three family house on the other part of the site using standard and much cheaper construction. The parcel is sloping, so a very neat feature is that four of these units could be made fully accessible for families or kids with disabilities without needing to build and maintain expensive elevators. Yes, this would bring in half as much revenue for the developer, but it would also cost half as much to build and run and could house about the same number of people. The town has lots of crucial housing needs. Yes, this would not be an SRO, but this would meet other key priorities of the town and be a very smart use of this specific parcel. I hope you will consider this compromise solution of the town acquiring this parcel and redoing the process to allow for community-driven development of affordable housing. Thank you. And the last speaker is Haley Hughes. I'll try to be here. Thank you. My name is Haley Hughes. I live on <laughs> My name is Haley Hughes. I live at 30 Orchard Street. This is my very first PowerPoint presentation, so my third grader helped me. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk about next steps and how we might find a, pro a compromise. To begin with, this has been an adversarial process. Um, okay. Valley acquired the property in January. Neighbors first had an informational meeting on April 24th. Prior to that, Valley had been, the developer had been meeting with the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust and the Coalition for Affordable Housing. Cursory review of the meeting minutes published said that part of those meetings had spent time addressing and how to preempt concerns from the neighbor of the development. The developer already has $65,000 devoted to their budget for an attorney. I'm here to stop that. I'm actually an attorney but I do a lot of pro bono work at Springfield Family and Probate Court, and I work on conciliations. And when we start for a child custody conciliation, I really like to s tell parents how lucky their kid is because there are two parents in the room wanting to spend time with them. And I look at this packed room, and I think that we're actually a lot closer to where we all want to be than it seems. And I think that with a few steps, we can find some compromise. And Actually, Councillor Dumont, you brought something up at one of the last meetings I was at that has lingered with me, usually at 3 in the morning when I'm up, can't sleep, which is what precedent are we setting? And I'm thinking about what precedent are we setting with this project, but also the upcoming capital projects with the schools and the library. And do we really want to continue this adversarial process? How can we sit and work together? So I want to go over some commonalities and basic understandings as I see them. Right now, we understand that the developer owns 132 Northampton Road and that affordable housing will be on that property. And we all think that's great. We understand that despite almost unanimous support in our neighborhood for family housing, that this development will have some single occupancy studios. We're there. We know that the developer cares about this vulnerable subsection of the population. And implicit in that is the 20 hours a week of on-site care management there proposing. We all support, support, we all support affordable housing and want to support our residents. There are some unanswered questions. What happens if the developer cannot fill all the 50% and 80% AMI slots? That's fine because they can slide down to different income gaps, but there's been no proposal on how those ex that extra population would get extra care. Um, if extra on-site care is a good thing, can we look to outside funding or grants to extend the care offered? Is there a way to partner with the School of Social Work or provide class credits to help extend care on-site? There are all sorts of ways we can think outside of the box and try to address this and perhaps offer more care. So we're looking at town council to make a decision. And I kind of broke it down in my mind into two things. You're approving the $500,000 bond, but you're also giving them the approval that they need to go secure state funding. And I think 
that's almost worth more than the $500,000. And so we need to figure out what will the proposed bond have on the state regulated bonding capacities of the town as we look towards other capital projects. We need to figure out if the concerns brought up tonight should be addressed prior to funding the approval. And look at what the town council's duty to the town is. So there's the idea of a fiduciary duty that you, we have voted for you, we are entrusting you to look out for all citizens of the town and to manage our money wisely. There's also what I like to call the fun buster parent, which is the, I'm a mom, you know, my kid wrote a report and showed it to me and I was like, you can do better. And I kind of feel like we're at the point where I'm asking you to be the fun busters and say, we're not saying this is bad, but we're saying we can do better as a town, as a community, and as a developer, I and neighbors, I think we can do better. Um, and why not wait for the ZBA? I think about the school debates, and I think about how Dr. Morris, at the last minute, asked if he could change the schools into two co-located K through six schools as a form of compromise, and was told it was too late. His funding had been his application had been approved as, as is, and once the developers secure state funding, it's a lot harder to have substanti substantial change in the application. So I think the time to do it is now before we get approval. Um, so here's my proposed solution. Town Council deny funding for this project as presented and invite Valley CDC to come back next year when the CPA can fund the project out of cash without having to take a bond and when Valley CDC can demonstrate that they have worked with neighbors and addressed the concerns and facts presented tonight. What happens in this intervening year? The town can pay out of CPA funds rather than taking on a bond and impacting the ability to borrow for other capital projects. Town Council, I read almost every single meeting minute in preparation for tonight. I know that on your agenda is a capital plan and a master zoning plan. You'll be able to incorporate this development into that plan. This will set the precedent, precedent that developers and neighbors must demonstrate the ability to work together and address concerns prior to seeking approval from the town because this is not gonna be the first and last issue like this to come before town council. We can also harness the data and research provided by the neighbors. We want this to succeed and maybe we can have some out of the box ways of doing this. Finally, as stated, with seven homeless residents from Amherst. This is not really gonna substantially affect, impact the funding for Craig's Doors or Community Connections and other services. We're gonna to have to maintain those services at level or increase them over the next few years. I know the developer would suffer a loss in a year, but they could offset some of those costs by renting out the property for a year until we secure funding. And this is my aspiration that we create a data-driven landmark generational project using proactive measures. What I mean is this, I look at the call data and I think, gosh, that's kind of a reactive measure. That's using other resources. If we were proactive and had more on-site management, as Valley said, we can reduce some of those phone calls. Um, after a year of planning, we're a stronger, kinder community together. We set the precedent for future development concerns demonstrating a way to work together. And I will leave you with this. In a successful conciliation, both parties want to feel like they've won, but also given a little bit too. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We are, um, it's been requested that we take a brief break. I don't know how the bathrooms in this facility are gonna handle that. Um, all I suggest is that if it's urgent, run. Uh, so we will reconvene at um, five minutes of eight. Thank you. We have one more presentation, uh, and then we are going to move to counselors asking clarifying questions. However, the big period that we've reserved, frankly, is for public comment and questions. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Christine Berthstrip, I've asked her to review the timeline going forward. Let me just mention prior to that timeline, uh, actually she has it up here. Uh, we start with tonight's meeting tomorrow morning at 9.30. The Finance Committee is meeting to review the CPAC proposals. 
and the the CPAC this CPAC proposal we have already re reviewed all the others and we have already accepted and passed them by town council and then on July 1st the town council will be meeting in a regular meeting and it's expected that this will be on their agenda at that time um, so given that Chris would you just briefly provide us with additional information since you understand the process at this point sure good evening I'm pleased to be with you I'm Chris Brestrup planning director and I'm going to run you through the uh, the timeline that we envision for this project if it goes forward um, we've already talked about what's happened a little in the past and what's happening in the next few weeks um, this timeline assumes that Valley CDC will move forward with the project submitting the required information and documentation to begin the permitting process I have copies of this timeline on the back table. I made 100 copies. I thought that might be too many, but I guess not. So uh, maybe you can share with people, or we'll put it on the town website, and you'll be able to see it tomorrow. So it would, excuse me, Chris. It was already posted as part of our agenda items for today. Yes. So um, the project application is expected to be submitted and reviewed through a chapter 40B comprehensive permit application process. And that would be reviewed by the town's Zoning Board of Appeals. This process usually takes about four to six months to complete. Um, I put a link on this uh, sheet to the um, Chapter 40B handbook for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, it was published in 2017 and it has some really good information about how the uh, Chapter 40B process works. You might want to take a look at that on the website, I mean on the, uh, on the uh, online, on that website. Um, so anyway, how this is going to go is, and I'm gonna highlight uh, opportunities for people to um, have public comment, either written or uh, verbal. Um, so Valley CDC would submit its project eligibility request to its subsidizing agency, and that could be the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, or it could be another subsidizing agency. Um, and that would begin the Chapter uh, 40B application process. This would be in month one. We're not sure exactly when Valley uh, proposes to submit its application, so that's why we call this month one instead of July. Um, so once Valley CDC submits its request to the subsidizing agency, the subsidizing agency sends a notification letter to the town, to the town's chief elected official. So in my estimation, that would be uh, Council President um, Lynn Griesmer. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the subsidizing agency would schedule a site visit, and the site visit would probably include um, members of the Housing Trust and members of the town council. Then the town has 30 days to submit comments to the subsidizing agency about whether uh, or not um, people think that this project should get a project eligibility letter. Um, the notification letter and project eligibility application will be posted on the town's website um, and sent to the relevant boards and committees who might have comments on it. And that would include the planning board, it would probably include the police department, it would include the fire chief um, and numerous other boards and committees in town. Information about this project as a whole, including plans and um, elevations of the building and plans of the building, will also be posted on the website. So whatever information we get, we'll put up and you can see it. Uh, members of the public will be able to submit letters during this 30-day comment period. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that the town planning department staff would uh, compile the letters during this period. Um, we're planning to put an online comment process on the website so that you can either choose to type out a letter and send it in, you can send an email in, or you can uh, use this online process. We will compile the public comments and all public comments will be sent to the subsidizing agency. We'll send it with a cover letter. Um, if you wanted an example of this type of uh, process, you could look to the Beacon Project in North Amherst. The subsidizing agency will issue a decision, either a project eligibility letter, which means a yes, or a denial of the project eligibility letter. And that will happen uh, after the end of the comment period. And it can take varying amounts of time for this decision to be put forth. 
the developer of LACDC, the chief elected official, the president of the council, and the Zoning Board of Appeals will each receive a copy of that decision. And the decision of the subsidizing agency will be posted on the town's website. Then in months two and three, um, assuming the subsidizing agency issues the project eligibility letter, Valley CDC can submit its Chapter 40B comprehensive permit application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. This permit application will consist of a lot of documents, an application form, a list of waivers that they're asking for from uh, zoning requirements, um, a set of site plans, uh, civil engineering and architectural drawings. Um, these will describe the project in detail. They'll also have to submit a management plan, which would be very detailed about how they're gonna manage the property. Um, and information about the proposed rents that will be charged will also be submitted. There's a fee to Valley CDC to submit this application, and um, we'll be required to, we'll be requiring them to fill out an application for a list of abutters, and then we will notify abutters. All of the application materials will be posted on the town's website for everybody to see. And then in months four through six, once Valley submits its application, the Zoning Board of Appeals has 30 days in which to open a public hearing. So they have to do all their advertising in the Gazette and sending notices to abutters in that 30 days and start the hearing. Um, abutters within 300 feet will receive a written notification. The Zoning Board of Appeals will open its public hearing and it may last for several sessions. The last time we went through this process, the process opened in October, at the end of October. It lasted through November, December, January, and then in the beginning of February, a decision was made. So that was a little more than, certainly more than three months, probably about four months. Um, within 180 days of opening the public hearing, the Zoning Board of Appeals <coughs> must render a decision. So in other words, they, they can't drag this process out forever. They have basically a six month deadline, but I'm sure that it will take um, probably a lot of, of that time. So there are opportunities for the public to submit um, comments throughout this process, um, and boards and committees can also submit comments to the ZBA. The Zoning Board of Appeals is sort of like the central clearinghouse for this type of project. And you can submit your comments in writing, and you can also come to the meetings, you can come to all the sessions, and if you are recognized by the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals, you'll be allowed to speak. Um, a positive vote of three members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, three out of five, would be required to approve the project. Um, the decision of the ZBA must be filed with the town clerk within 40 days of the close of the public hearing. So if the public hearing went on for, say, three months, then 40 days after the public hearing closes, the ZBA has to file its decision with the town clerk. And we post the decision on the town website. And then there's the 20-day appeal period in which either the applicant, if the applicant doesn't like the decision, or a, uh, an abutter or a group of abutters can uh, appeal the decision. If abutters appeal the decision, they have to file um, their uh, appeal with the superior court or the land court. And that's, that's pretty much the, um, the process. And if you have questions, um, you can refer to this sheet, bring it home, and if you have questions, you can email me or call me and I can answer your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn to my colleagues on the council and ask at this point, do you have clarifying questions? Then we are going to go to public comment during which you may be either called on or have another point you want to make at that time. Alyssa. I just have a super quick thing about the project eligibility letter. I would just like us to receive notification from town council that that assumption of chief executive, chief elected officer actually is a town council president because that's not usually true and that's general law. Fine. And so we should just have that. We should just have a piece of paper that says that. Thank you. Other comments? Mindy Joe. So I'll ask a question. Oop, there we go. Um, Valley CDC, uh, this question's for them, if, if okay. you would give them a chance to respond if they can. Um, we've heard a lot of concerns about the 30, 50, and 80% levels, um, and 
that that's the maximum. Um, so if there aren't, say, eight applicants that qualify between the 50 and 80 percent AMI level for those eight units, in theory, that might be able, my understanding is, to be given to or rented that unit or units could be rented to someone that has a 50 percent or lower income, AMI income. Um, so the question I have, in a way, is um, if there aren't enough applicants at the above 50 percent AMI level, for the eight units up to the 80 AMI, or above 30% AMI for those that are up to 50% AMI, those eight units, um, what happens? Do they get rented to the lower, to even lower income? And that is, I know that is a concern that has been expressed by the residents, so what sort of protections does maybe the town have um, to guarantee that eight of those units are rented to individuals between the 50 and 80 AMI um, and that eight, eight of those units in this proposal are rented to individuals with incomes between 30 and 50 AMI. I know there's going to be residents are, who are scattered among all of us here, all of you living in Amherst, not just neighbors and abutters, but uh, which will probably be the same, around the same question. So if you don't mind, we'll wait we'll and wait. Add to that, thank you. Are there other questions? Andy. I think that it would be helpful if um, Ms. Brestrup would clarify that whether um, the Developer Valley CDC has the right to go to the subsidizing agency and seek funding re um, regardless of whether or not the council approves the um, Community Preservation Act proposal. That's um, one question, and the other is um, based upon other projects, because I know it, it would be um, unfair and impossible to speculate on this one, what types of conditions might a ZBA um, apply and uh, add to um, the process? Um, go ahead, Chris. Yes. You might want to stick to the first question and then we might do the other one later. Um, the first question being what happens if Valley CDC can't get enough people at 80% or less AMI? No, is no. Question, what happens if Valley CDC does not receive $500,000 voted for by the town council? Valley CDC is at liberty to apply for their project eligibility letter, whether or not the town gives them the $500,000. They've already received um, two sums of money from the town, um, $50,000 and $200,000 um, to help them with the feasibility study and payment of architectural fees, et cetera. Um, so it's, a, it's really up to them. They need to show their uh, subsidizing agency that they have some uh, support from the town. And so this other 500,000 would go a long way to showing that the town supports the project, but they don't absolutely need it. Thank you. And you asked about what types of conditions the um, town might, or the Zoning Board of Appeals might put on this project? Yes. Well, um, the example that I'm thinking of is the Beacon Project in North Amherst. I think there were 130 conditions. So there are all kinds of conditions about um, what level of income various um, people, tenants would have um, moving into the, into the facility. Um, for instance, in Beacon's case, um, they had a certain number of uh, tenants that were going to be 50% uh, or less AMI and a certain number of tenants who were going to be 30% or less AMI, and that was written into the conditions. Um, there are lots of conditions about what happens to the site, how parking is handled, um, information that uh, the developer needs to give to the tenants about um, services in the area, as for, for example, bus stops or how the property is managed, just on and on and on. It's all lots and lots of conditions. So um, if there were a particular topic that you were interested in, I might be able to answer a specific question. Are those conditions available on the website? 
I believe they should be. Um, if you go to um, the town uh, website and look up uh, 194 Montague Road, I think it is, um, you will see a special permit application for um, Beacon Communities and their North Square project, and you should be able to get all the conditions from, from that. There would be a link to a decision. If you can't find it, you can call me in the town planning department, and I would be happy to um, help you to find that on the website. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, Shalini. So this is regarding uh, the concern about the number of calls um, that people living in studio apartments might uh, uh, might be involved in that. And I, based on one research that I read, that um, we could be saving $6,000 per person because these people are out there already. And when they're out facing the conditions and whatnot, the likelihood of the calls, emergencies, and whatnot is really high. And so what this study documented was bringing them into housing actually reduced the cost to the cities by $6,000 per person. I'm not saying that would be our cost, but I'm wondering if the chief of police could be invited to speak to what he thinks in Amherst, how would, you know, what. Uh, what his perspective is in terms of emergency calls and so forth. I know he's here someplace. Please come forward. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. What we were. Yeah, so um, the concern is uh, that. If we have 28 people living in that apartment, it might increase the number of calls. And uh, and I'm looking at the cost to the town currently. When people are homeless, they're they're still calling. They're still calling on emergency and police. And sure. so, do you, what is your perception of them being moved into a house? And yeah, I mean, it's difficult to put numbers on something like that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, Will there be increases in calls? Potentially, potentially not. Um, I can tell you from our experience in any uh, resident or rented unit, the biggest factor in call response and the need for officers and probably for fire as well is management and management team. So as long as we have good communication and good working um, cohesiveness with whoever that management team is, I don't anticipate very many problems. Um, you know, from homelessness perspectives, we get a lot of, so about, you know, we have average between 17 and 18,000 calls per year total for police response. And about 12% of those are for homelessness issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do the math. But the reality is two, two individuals are responsible for about 80% of those calls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's... Mm -hmm. Tough to put a pinpoint on how many calls we would have. Okay. I'm sure we'll come back to the issue of public safety, so don't go away. <laughs> Other, Mandy Jo, yeah. I'm gonna try and put them all into sort of one speech so that then I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, the, the comprehensive permit is not a, I, I don't wanna use the word normal, a not a, there's another option for applying for a permit for this one, which would just be applying for a special permit. Um, so I guess one of my questions is, um, why go through the comprehensive permit process under 40B instead of the special permit process? And I recognize one of those answers might be, you only need three votes on the ZBA instead of four, and a special permit would be four. But I'm curious about that and whether if a um, the, the letter from the funding agency, authorizing agency is denied, could Valley CDC still apply for a special permit under the non-comprehensive permit process? Um, I would love to have Valley CDC address the um, cost to develop this piece, given the US Housing and Urban Development Guidelines that put a affordable 500 square foot house below by about 30 or $40,000 um, on average the cost that is proposed for this unit, this project. Um, and 
I'm curious about whether it would be the ZBA process that restricts the number of units. Um, if the town council votes to fund this project, um, could Valley CDC between now and when they apply to the ZBA increase the number of units before the application um, or even decrease them? Um, where, where is that limit? Chris. So my understanding with regard to why a comprehensive permit instead of a special permit is that Valley CDC is seeking to increase the density on the property, um, increase the number of units that would normally be allowed in the RG zoning district. And I don't have at my fingertips the exact number um, that they could achieve with a special permit. Perhaps Ms. Baker knows that. Um, but they were seeking uh, more density because it's, um, it's easier for them to develop the more units they have. Um, cost to develop, I can't answer that. I can answer the ZBA process um, that restricts the number of units. The ZBA can restrict the number of units. Again, in the case of the Beacon Project, initially um, they came in, I believe they wanted to build 140 units. They, they cut that down to 130 for the Beacon Project. Um, for the project uh, Aspen Heights, which wasn't a comprehensive permit proce process, but just to give you a sense of what the ZBA can accomplish is that they reduce the number of units from, uh, well, by a whole floor. So I'm gonna say it was um, you know, probably on the order of 44 units that were cut out, and then eventually, as a result of an appeal, it became even smaller. But um, the ZBA can uh, negotiate with the developer about the number of units. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. We may get back to other questions oh, regarding costs and so forth. Yeah. Okay. I am having um, a confusion of understanding the roles and responsibilities. Um, when the council is asked to vote, they're not being asked, are you in favor of affordable housing? Um, everybody here has said and stated in writing and in, in person that they are in favor of affordable housing. We're going to be asked to vote on this particular project with this plan in this place. And many of us have asked for more specifics about the management plan. I cannot for the life of me understand how it is not the business of the town council and yet it's the business of zoning, a, a board of zoning appeals which has to do with land and zoning um, and not our business. Um, it's human services, it deals with quality of life, and we're just being asked to take it on trust. And I just find that, that I would not feel that I was doing my duty if I did not know more about it. And um, I've had discussions with Valley CDC, I know that they're thinking about some of these aspects, but I don't know why we can't get more details. Um, certainly the question, I understand why, um, one live-in counselor. I think that is perhaps not a good idea for a lot of reasons that were said tonight. But most of us, many of us feel that if there were more, a stronger management plan to make sure that the individuals who needed services were connected to those services so that they have a strong chance of success. So I'm not just talking about the neighborhoods and the, re the residents who live around the place. I'm talking about the people who would be the new tenants. It is to Amherst's responsibility to make sure that particularly after all of this, this is a huge process that's, that's going to take months and months, great expense, that we actually accomplish something which is socially good, which is the, um, as the former resident said, the opportunity to put one's life in order. So that's, I don't see why we can't have some more details. I understand things have to be dealt with in more detail as it goes on, but why for or by Jan uh, July 1st, when we have to vote, that the town council members can't have more information so we can make an informed vote on this very important issue. Are there other questions from the council at this point? Let me share with you the general broad areas and introduce the concept for public comment. So first of all, um, we have many people who would like to comment. Some of you signed in as you came in just because you were coming in. Some of you signed in saying, thinking that was the registration for public comment. It wasn't, okay? <laughs> um, 
we are going to try to do public comment by grouping issues, okay? And the issues that I have identified, and I'm certainly open to suggestions of additions, begin with the selection of the location, which goes all the way back to how did we get to this location? The second is the size and scale of the project, the number of units, whether there's any possibility of doing some kind of mix and leading, going to Mandy Joe's, is there any possibility that we would agree to some funding that's 28, but you, they, that you, the application would actually go in higher? The third is how do we screen tenants, the process, the procedures, and if we can't fill the slots at each of the designated levels, how does that happen? The fourth is the whole issue of some kind of supportive and live-in staff that would be there, if not 24-7, a major portion of the time. The fifth um, is public safety and emergency services. The sixth is consideration of financial matters, both initial cost and plans for ongoing support. Mindy Jo, I think cost was one of the issues you raised as well. Uh, the seventh is anything I've left out. <laughs> and the eighth is what is the process going forward, including any additional questions about the time frame and the um, permitting process. So what I'd like to suggest is that we hear concerns and then I will look for people who have positive and definite information to address those concerns and then move to the next issue. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> the second thing is, and there'll be plenty of time for everyone to comment, except if the point we get to where we're basically hearing the same thing over and over again and then I will ask that we move on to the next topic because we've heard that and we need to move on. Okay, is there an additional topic that people do not feel I have addressed? Yes, the topic. The, pro the process of this meeting that is biased in favor of people who object to the housing. Okay, yes. Okay. Okay. Are there other topics? Yes. John. Hold on, John. We haven't heard from neighbors who favor the project. We've <laughs> Mm -hmm. given, been given the impression that the neighbors pro mm -hmm. oppose the project. Um, and the second thing is um, we heard some comments from at least one person who has experience living in an SRO and one per two people, sorry. We haven't heard from people who have the experience of working directly with tenants of uh, a project like this. Okay. There was one more hand back there. Yes. I wanted to present some information specifically about the legal obligations under federal and state anti-discrimination laws that are relevant to the council's decision. Okay. All right. So let's reorder this and start with, are there any people who are in the category of neighbors and abutters who would like to add a comment that's in favor of the project? We're going to do three minute maximums. I see a hand all the way back there. Come forward please to the mic. No, in favor as it currently stands. 
Okay, thank you for the clarification. Your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Michael Giles. I live on Blue Hills Road, 57 Blue Hills Road. Uh, and thank you for giving folks in favor a chance to speak. Um, I, I personally know of a, a large number of neighbors who are, can be thought of as abutters who are in favor of the project as it stands. Um, and just wanted to speak a little bit. I think I had a bunch of things to talk about. I think there's been a lot of good letters written, editorials written. Um, I don't feel like I need to keep hitting the issues of the values of SROs in general. I want to talk a little bit about some of the concerns that have been raised tonight uh, and that I think they fall in a couple different buckets. Um, one of which, just from all my years on town meeting, is one of the best ways to stop a project is to say that you are really in favor of it, except you want a little more time to consider it um, and try to tweak it a little bit and, and make it a little bit better, um, which often leads to things not in general, these things not happening at all. Um, I think the way this project has been proposed, um, I am quite confident to say it is not perfect in every single dimension. Uh, I think it would be pretty hard to find a better location in the town of Amherst when you look at its proximity to services, its lack of really tight abutters, um, its ability to build a, a unit at this scale um, with, with a bunch of open space around it. Uh, but I think, you know, again, I think a lot of these comments stem from this sense that once we unleash this, you know, it, it could potentially just go off the rails in some terrible way. Uh, I think, you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of experience with the Valley CDC and uh, various uh, roles they've played in the area. They obviously have a deep commitment to supporting affordable housing and to building additional affordable housing units in Amherst and in all the surrounding towns. Um, they are highly motivated to make this project work. If the project, as it is proposed, which they believe, based on their experience, is an appropriate proposal, if things are not working, uh, as, as the chief of police said, having a partner who manages it, who is motivated to make the situation work, tends to lead to things working out over time. You, you come up with an approach and a system that works. So as an abutter for me, you know, I think I do trust the Valley CDC. I've seen their work over many years. Uh, and I have faith that if, as they believe the project, they have a lot of reason to believe this is an appropriate approach with the level of on-site management. If that isn't working, I also have a lot of faith that adjustments will be made and things, things will be adjusted. Uh, and so I think, you know, the opportunity for us to house a significant number, and again, yeah, yes, this is just a drop in the bucket of all the affordable housing needs that the town has, but to get started and to house a significant number of people who really have no other options in the town of Amherst today uh, is a really huge opportunity that I'm excited for. Uh, I am, you know, a little saddened to hear so much negative support from, from neighbors in, in our neighborhood as well, uh, but I understand people have fears and concerns. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a heck of a lot of evidence to counter all of those around how these uh, developments tend to, tend to work, the types of people who live in them, um, that uh, I, you know, I can speak for myself and a number of neighbors who weren't able to come tonight who asked me to come speak uh, to say that there is also an awful lot of support uh, in the abutting neighborhoods to see this happen and that we feel really great that our neighborhood could actually support and see something like this through uh, to, to really help the town of Amherst get started on addressing Thank you. this need. Thank you for your comment. Others in that same category, yes, please come forward, state your name. Thank you. Uh, David Offeld, I live at 59 Blue Hills Road, right next door to Mike, actually. Uh, I've lived there for 30 years. Uh, I'm, I'm within the neighborhood that um, uh, Mr. George drew on his excellent map uh, with, with a circle and within that definition of neighborhood. And it occurs to me if I drew that a same circle of the same radius from my house, it would include the old rafters, the recently closed rafters, it would include Amity Place, it might even include the movie theater, I'm not sure <laughs> if it would go up that far. I, I really appreciate my, my neighbors' uh, detailed evaluation of the project and thoughtful consideration of uh, the many issues that, that this rises. Um, I've studied their analysis. I've also looked at what CDC has, has put out, and I've concluded that CPA funding should be approved now by the council. 
One thing I did want to mention uh, is about uh, the character of the neighborhood, that issue Mr. George had described. I think I understood him to talk about building appearance as an indicator of character, and there are a lot of single family homes on Northampton Road um, that, or at least appear to be single family homes of that, of that architectural style. But in fact, there, there, a lot of them are student rentals, which is a different character. And that's fine. They've, I've been neighbors with, with the students as they've come and gone over, over all these years, and, and they're great neighbors. Um, if, you, if, you, if you do, my, in my count of the, of the properties on Northampton Road, about a third are owner-occupied single family. About a third are uh, privately owned student rental properties we'd call student rentals. I think I counted 64 beds available if they're at their capacity. And the remaining, is, as Mr. George noted, are Amherst College dorms and, other, and, and, and a couple of apartment buildings. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's the nature of, uh, in terms of the character, I think it's the nature of living downtown that the, that, uh, the, the, the character uh, changes quickly. In other words, I, I walk down my street, Blue Hills Road, I come out to Northampton Road, suddenly and I'm, I'm in a little micro neighborhood of student rentals. I walk the other way and I'm at the Jones Library. It's, it's, it's the nature of living downtown and that's great. So I welcome this project and I welcome uh, my Sorry. neighbors. Sorry, is that you. the time? Okay. Are there other comments in the category of neighbors, butters, who are would like to speak in favor of the project? Please come forward. My name is Kathy Neal. I. Um, lived on Dana Street for 20 years and all my neighbors, hello. <laughs> I left Dana Street and moved to Amity Place. And uh, I consider myself still in the neighborhood because I walk the neighborhood a lot. I would like to say that I support this. I worked in public education my whole life. Places like Amherst, uh, many teachers who are starting out in the profession travel an hour or more to get to our schools because they simply cannot afford to live in places like Amherst. So please don't just think of this as the homeless place. Please think of this as a place that is inclusive of people who have chosen to teach your children. Thank you. Are there other comments in this group? Yes, I'm sorry, sir. Please come forward. Thank you. My name is David Levenstein. I live at 100 Woodside Avenue. I had hope, but I knew that I was not going to be able to resist speaking tonight. <laughs> I support the project as proposed. I have a lot of questions about the project. I agree with a lot of people having spoken that it's a proposal. There are things to be worked out, I'm sure. It seems to me that that process will be worked out with the Zoning Board of Appeals and the conditions that will be imposed. Or, and, and, and that's reasonable to me. I do think that there are legitimate questions that I would like um, responded to. Mandy Jo, I think Kate asked about the relative costs per square meter. That's, I didn't have three minutes. Oh, shit. No, I didn't. I didn't. You just started. Um, I agree with, 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 I'm not quite sure, Mike, if that was your name. It is a great way to prevent a project from proceeding to go, we need to make it even better. We need to ask even more questions. You know, I am curious about what sort of waivers the uh, Valley CDC are going to request under the 40B permitting process. Why 28 units? That'll, you know, why is that the right number? I think that there are a lot of alarms that I just can't imagine being 
other than just nerves about change occurring, that um, there will be increased emergency calls. These are many people, the, 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 the most at-risk populations, it seemed to me in the, the proposal, are already, I believe, our neighbors. We just don't see them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know of people who live within this, the radius that, I'm not quite sure who, Mr. George maybe perhaps described. There, there are people who live there under trestles already. And that's alarming to me. That's more alarming than, I think, offering an, a sustainable, a, 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 a safe place to live. And so I will stop. I think that was a malfunction. It's a malfunction. Uh, OK, OK. Oh, it's the real telephone. Oh, thank you. That's what it sounded like. There it was. Okay. Are there others who would like to comment in this category? Oh, just going. Oh, it's this kid. What do you call it? Um, that was a call-in speaker. I would like to go on to the issues, and I am sure that there will be people who are neighbors and abutters who would like to add to the statements that have been already made. So let's start with the issue of the selection of the location. Are there people who have questions or concerns about that specific issue? Please come forward. single-family neighborhood. So my first question is, why that place? Why not have gone to a home that had a big piece of land close to the university place and said, I know your home isn't for sale, but we're willing to give you X amount <laughs> of money for the property because this would be a wonderful place to build housing that is very much needed in this town. And one of the things I found very disturbing tonight was that this is, has been characterized as an SRO for homeless people. It's my understanding that there are some units set aside for people who are homeless, but that there'll be other people who are employed, uh, who cannot afford rents in town, who would be living there. I lived in New York City a block away from mm, dozens, literally dozens of buildings that had been turned into SROs. No one in those buildings bothered me for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I was the president of the block association that included their block. I was a, a, the community relations officer for the hospital that supplied the support in those buildings. 
The people in the buildings very often preyed on each other. They didn't bother the homeowners or building owners around the property. So I can't say I'm against this, but I can't say I'm quite for the location. For example, if you don't have a car and you live at that site and you would like to use a bus, the sidewalk on Dana Street. You need Street, to wrap up, please. Okay, the sidewalk on Dana Street is incomplete. It's a third of the block. You have to walk during the winter and during the summer in the, in the traffic part of the gutter in order to get to Amity Street where there is a bus. The bus stop is at the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill. This Thank you for your comments. So yeah. I just question the location. I don't question the concept. Thank you. Is there anybody else who has a comment about the location? Please come forward. Watch out for the cards. Hi, I'm Abby Jensen. I live at 100 Dana Street. And I, the previous speaker absolutely said about half I wanted to say. <laughs> And my understanding of the history of this site is it's the one property that came available during the period of time that they could buy. And so that's what makes it a good property, perhaps not a perfect property for this development. So m perhaps a better property would come up in the next year, for all we know. That would be even better, for one thing. And a second one is, um, I was in favor of changing our town government. I was on town meeting for many years. You might know me. Called the question a lot. So, um, <laughs> so um, one of the reasons why I wanted a different form of government is because it could be proactive. And we can actually plan strategically. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this project is not a strategic plan. It happened to be the, pro the this property became available in the time period that they had. So I absolutely agree that there are better properties. And I, my memory is even one of those houses had been condemned at one point, and they even brought it back from the brink. So there are better properties that I think would um, be better for this project. So I am for this. And in fact, I'm not afraid of these potential neighbors at all. But another thing that I think people didn't bring up, and I don't know why, um, eggshells perhaps, is the great risk to our neighborhood if Amherst College decides to close Pratt Field to the um, public. I think that's a real risk. And the infraction, quote, could be entirely minor. And Amherst College will not have to justify their reasons for closing Pratt Field. They will just do it if they think it's in mm -hmm. the best interest of their students. They are not going to justify it to our community. They will close it. And Pratt Field is an enormous resource to our community. I know people even from Amity Place use those fields and, and the track, et cetera. And even people from the wider community use that. And so um, I think it's likely that that will close, probably for very unjustified reasons, however. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to the issue of location? Yes. I hope this is the right place for this. Um, my name's William Loines. I lived for uh, years with my wife and three kids at 25 Orchard Street, which is actually abutting the property uh, and is contiguous to it. And we now live across the street uh, from that house in 14 Orchard Street. So uh, I hope this is about uh, on, on topic. Uh, the developer characterized the neighborhood as the Route 9 corridor, and it says a big rental will fit in very nicely. And as Steve George said, most of the neighborhood is not like the Route 9 corridor. Among the rentals, there are junior faculty rentals, houses owned by Amherst College and occupied by young families. There are student rentals, which have been spreading along the Route 9 corridor and, uh, frankly, have been um, some, some sort of a nuisance. Uh, the house at 132 Northampton Road was a, is a single family house, the not quite historic carriage house of the historic Anston Morris house that Al and Barbara Wilbur live in. 
Um, that site could be a site for affordable family housing that would be attractive to families in the neighborhood, match the scale of the current house, and meet a pressing need for the town. In fact, when I first saw the Valley CDC had bought the property, I thought that's what they planned, and I was grateful that it wasn't going to be another student rental. But replacing it instead with a four-story, 28-person or larger, maybe, development that would dwarf the largest student rental on Route 9 doesn't seem like it would fit right in. They should build affordable family housing at that site. Thank you. Is there anybody else on this issue? This is the location. Yes, come forward, please. Good evening, um, Connie Kruger. Some of you might know me, um, former select board member. Also worked in the affordable housing field for um, probably 25 years or more. So I think I have some standing. I had to try to fit what I wanted to say into your categories, Lynn. So I, I think site might be um, the time I have something to offer. So there is no perfect site. And people have said for and against that, um, well, it's not perfect. It might be okay. Well, actually, I've looked at a lot of sites um, across the state. I did technical assistance for municipalities statewide. I also um, did a lot of work with um, Chapter 40B. So I have seen a lot of properties. And I don't think this is just, this is the best one they could find in the time they had. I think actually looking at the criteria that um, Valley's described, that the Housing Trust has described, and what I know about that site on the State Highway Route 9, it's actually a very good site, while not perfect, because nothing is. Um, I think it meets a lot of the criteria that we would look for for the subsidizing agency I used to work for or for one of the other state funders. So um, I think it's a good site. I think it's a good developer. And probably not surprising, I do support this proposal. But I just want to share one thing. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this because I know people who live in that neighborhood. I know people who have a lot of feelings about this proposal. And what's really important to me is that we don't vilify each other in this process and that we stay open to having this dialogue. The town's really in the driver's seat of what's going to happen here, both in the CPA funding, although it's not the determinant of whether this goes forward or not, but also in the 30-day comment period in the Chapter B. 40B process and in the comments that the ZBA is going to get. There's a lot of level of detail that we won't have. Um, in a Chapter 40B project, deliberately you do not ask for um, a huge amount of detail up front because it's so expensive. First, you want to know that you have a project that's viable and is going to go forward. And then you bring in professionals and sort of layer in more and more detail. To me, what's most important is Design and management. We talked. You heard a lot about that tonight about tenant selection. You heard from the management company. That's what's going to make this fit into the neighborhood. And if we can continue to communicate and be open about this, we're not going to hopefully end up with ten years from now we're not speaking to each other because we're on different sides of this issue. Because mm -hmm. this is um, going to be another neighbor that I really hope is welcomed into the neighborhood, but I want to speak to my friends and neighbors mm -hmm. across our different views of this and mm -hmm. not... Um, Excuse me, time please. I'm, okay, and so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Yes, this is on the issue of the actual site selection. Yes. I think that site um, is worthy of careful consideration and part of what's been so difficult here has been the sense that the project w was going to go forward irregardless of the site. And as when we found out about the project being neighbors nearby, we had lots of questions. And this is the first time that we've actually been able to together talk with the community about that. And um, 
we have moved as a neighborhood very far from our initial uh, shock, surprise, concern, to getting, doing lots and lots of research, understanding this project, coming up with lots of suggestions and ideas, and this is our first time to get to discuss this with, all, with everyone here. And it's been a horrible process. And I should, this should never ha happen again to any neighborhood group. That the fact that you have questions and want to discuss them, that you're vilified. I've been called all kinds of names because my name was out there. And I think that sight does matter. You, it's not just the concept of what you want to do, but then you have the process, and this needs to be uh, enabled in this town, of letting the neighborhood work with the developer on working it out. Because ultimately, don't you want all the parties, the town, the developer, the housing advocates, and the neighborhood to be happy about what's happening? Mm -hmm. But we haven't had the time or the opportunity to do that. And um, it's, been, it's been a very sad process. And I agree with Connie, thank you. And anyone that's you know said, great, tell, give us your, your suggestions. But I do want to say, we've moved this far, and we have not received one concession from the developer. We, they have been, refused to change anything. And that's made it very difficult because as we move more towards our center, we are not seeing any movement from the other side. And how, why should we trust that? Mm -hmm. There's no, what, what does that trust mean if you don't see any changes? There's not been one single change proposed. And I was hoping to be surprised tonight when I came that there would be a, some surprise change proposed. But I didn't hear any. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wants to speak to the issue of the selection of the location? I want to just ask whether Valley CDC or someone from your group has any further comment on the selection of this particular site. Mm -hmm. And we're going to ask you to keep it to three minutes as well. So we have written a bit on the town website about the site selection process. Um, Valley, this is our second effort over about 10 years trying to find a site for a property like this. We went through a site selection process uh, about 10 years ago, identified a site, made an offer on it. The uh, owner wanted far more than we had the ability to pay. We went off to do things in other towns. Uh, revisited this when the, the issue bubbled up again in Amherst that there was a high priority uh, for housing homeless folks. Um, so we took about two years. We looked at dozens of different sites uh, throughout town. We identified the midpoint of Northampton Road as a desirable space uh, because it, you could walk into town, into the health center, which is in this building, but you could also walk down to the shopping area. So no, it's not right next to a bus stop, but you can walk in either direction. Um, we did solicit a variety of owners on Northampton Road. We wrote to people asking if they'd be willing to sell their properties. Those who had the kind of large houses on large parcels, mm -hmm. we wrote to them, um, and we did not receive a response. So our universe of where we can build is limited to the properties that people are willing to mm -hmm. sell at a given point in time at a price that works within an affordable housing budget. Um, but we did a pretty aggressive look at everything that was available. We met with local realtors. We, we feel like we kind of beat the bushes, especially on Northampton Road. Um, and it's not just that it happened to come up for sale. It's a happy coincidence from our perspective that it did come up for sale, but we were already looking all the way up and down Northampton Road because it was walkable in both directions. It was a major road. It seems to us like a mixed neighborhood having institutional as well as residential uses. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next topic. Uh, the size and the scale of the project, the number of units, and the question about could there be of a mix of different kinds of units. Elisa. Elisa. Hi, 
My name's Elisa Campbell, and officially I'm here tonight representing the League of Women Voters, which does support this project and voting on it as proposed. I won't go on at great length about that because there have been other opportunities. I did want to just comment, though, on the idea of why this number of units, why this mix of units, et cetera. It's because there are homeless people in and around Amherst who need a place to live. There are also people who are not homeless, or at least not homeless yet, whose income is very limited. This project is intended to meet the needs of some, not all, but some of our neighbors in that situation. It cannot meet every need. It's not intended to be family housing. We do have another project going on at East Street that is intended to be family housing. No one project can meet every need. Each project can meet a little bit of what is, in fact, a very large and varied need. I was quite surprised personally to realize that I would qualify to live here if I didn't already have a somewhat bigger place to live, which I can still afford to live in. But these are, housing has become ridiculously expensive compared to what people's incomes are. And I suggest that if you're not aware that you go find the website for the low income, excuse me, I gotta get this website thing right. For the um, website with the data about what people earn and what rents are, it's reports, nlihc.org slash z-o-o-r slash Massachusetts and just look to see if you want to rent a one-bedroom apartment in Amherst now and not have it cost more than a third of your income, you have to make $57,000 a year. That's what it costs. So there is no perfect project. This is a good project that we need, and we need it now. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments with regard to the size and scale of the project, the number of units? Sir. Hi, I'm, I'm John Willoughby. I live at 100 Dana Street. Um, and I just wanted to share um, a survey I did for, for neighbors, um, and it's um, neighbors and abutters, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a selective survey. Um, it was for the people that were um, against the project as it stands, and so I got about, um, I can't remember how many people I asked, but I got 34 responses. I had a slide for it, it got kicked out of uh, the, um, <laughs> people's presentations. But I just wanted to share four results from it. Um, I start off by saying, are, are people in favor of affordable housing, period? And, and it was uh, 30 to two in favor. Are they in favor of having it in our, in our district? 31 to three in favor of having it in our district. Are they in favor of having it in the district? In that location, if it was family housing, it was 31 to one in favor of that. Are they in favor of this particular proposal? No, reversed. 31 to 1 against this proposal. And then I tried to break it down and say if it was half as big, if there was, um, if there was um, uh, supervision for 10 hours or for 24 hours, and then some people got there. And I just wanted to put that out there because there's been a big um, um, impression that we're anything but and we're kicking back. But actually, this isn't the only plan for affordable housing that could work. It seems to be driven by the economics of the Valley's uh, CTC um, more than anything else. There are, I think there are arguments against having a larger hostel with people that may be former addicts because the more, peop more people you have living with you, the more likely you're gonna, you're gonna get triggered. Um, and so I just wanted to share that, that uh, actually the, the people who are, are, are set as being against this have been talking about it and are totally 
I engaged in thinking about, hey, what would be the best thing in this location? Um, and so we don't have um, uh, a thing against the, the, the project and the ideal. In fact, I'm wearing a badge, most of us are. We're for it, we just don't think this is the right model for this particular location. So um, that was something we did. I wanted to add something else. It's, it's been a little bit mysterious because we haven't heard about it till later. I don't want to criticize you guys because you're doing an amazing job at, uh, um, with new government in Amherst. And I can see, here, see how tough it is and you're making the laws as you go. Not making the laws, but you're, you're trying to do the template as you go. Um, but I think the delay in letting us speak has meant that people have perceived us as being completely against this idea, absolutely against it. And so it's led to um, it's led to media campaigns like social media, and mm -hmm. um, you know we've been abused by people around town. We've been we've had letters have been sent. Um, people have been abused, and I just want to say I you know um, we could maybe have more dialogue and try and avoid this situation in the future because this is not the way we want to go. Because we're actually you know, part way towards you. Thank okay. you for your comments. Uh, other people to talk on about the size and scale of the project, please. Hi, Barbara Grabben Wilbur. My husband and I live at 126 Northampton Road. We are immediate abutters. Um, I wrote out what I was going to say because I tend to get a little nervous when I talk in front of people, particularly so many people. I have to say that I've been pleased with what's happening today. I second the thing about the, the sort of disrespect that's been shown from one side to the other, and I hope that that will not continue. Um, my husband and I would not be where we are today if it weren't for someone who did afford our housing. We had a great deal years and years ago. We've been in Amherst for over 50 years. Um, and I would like to give that back. But rather than look at this particular option, which I ask you all to think, look at your neighbors, who lives next to you? If you are in a single family home, and who's around you, are they single families? What would you do if tomorrow morning, the number of people that live there increased from three to five? No big deal. Increased from five to 28? The density, I think, is way too high. Um, again, I'm not opposed to affordable housing. I'm opposed to that high density. If you look at the place that they've just done on um, Main Street, where I think they accommodate 20 people, and this includes families, and that's a four-acre lot. This is a less than an acre lot, and they're trying to put 28 people on it. Um, I also think that we may be going in the wrong direction or perhaps not looking at the right thing. Affordable housing is important. But are there other ways that affordable housing can be addressed? Um, and maybe we challenge the town and the town councilors to get with developers and say, look, stop building these McMansions. Build something that is more affordable for middle income people. Um, these single family homes that are turned into rentals, is it possible to? put some kind of incentive in it for the homeowner that they would allow one of the apartments to be rented at a lower income, uh, a lower level. Um, is it possible to work with the local banks? We have a number of local hometown banks, East Hampton, Greenfield, Northampton, a Five College. Can they do some kind of a loan thing where uh, people with low incomes, that they get some additional support? I don't, that's how we got our place, is we were not charged bank fees. It made a big difference. We saved probably $250,000 by doing that. You need to wrap up. OK. Um, that's all that I have. Thank okay. you very much for listening, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this issue? Yes. Pull the mic up, please. But I do want to say something about the scale. Am I talking in the mic? Yes. 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 And, and the income levels. This is 28 people we're talking about. Eight, eight people will be living in studios. 
those people will ideally be making $31,000. Another eight people will be living in studios, and they will be making almost $50,000. So that's 16 people. The remainder of the 28, so this is, we're talking about 12 people. And I find it hard to imagine the scale of alarm, the scale of fear for what 12 people are going to do to a community. I just feel very sad. Um, it's not, I do see homeless people on the street and I do wish that they could have a house. Uh, down the block from me, there is Habitat for Humanity, and I was really happy when those houses went up. Up the block from me, there's University Place, which I believe has a large number of low-income people living in it. Uh, they they do not have a, ne a, a negative effect on my neighborhood. The scale is much larger, in fact, just north of me, of af affordable housing. But I, as I say, uh, my sense of the scale, we're talking about 10 homeless people and two people who might need services for mental health. I think the town could be more generous. Are there additional comments on the issue of size and scale of the project? Are you coming forward to make comment? Oh, yes, please. I'm trying to be brief. I'm trying to set a record for the shortest one. Um, Chris M77, uh, sorry, I said it to six point. Uh, Chris M77, Dana. Um, I was initially pretty excited about the prospect of having an affordable um, housing project go in, and um, as I learned more about it, it started to feel like the town agencies and the committees that have looked at it didn't really do their full set of diligence right. here, didn't. and we've seen a lot of uncritical repetition of claims, and that's sort of morphed into, in this discussion here, a lot of lectures on why affordable housing is good and why anyone who raises technical objections to the design of the project doesn't like homeless people and there's sort of an implication that everyone who points out problems and potential solutions for those problems here is hiding their true intent which is pretty hard so I just wanted to note that the project design has holes which aren't that far into the surface and these concerns all have solutions and they're really only showstoppers when we pretend they don't exist and we resort to name calling and questioning each other's motives. Uh, so the dull work of policy design is a lot less satisfying than denouncing class enemies. But uh, if we're serious about our community, it's worthy of us. So I had a fun moment this afternoon. My kids came home from camp with a flyer um, about a playground that's going up in Kendrick Park. And it invited people to come and join in the design of what the uh, equipment would look like and so on. So my first thought was, hey, great. I hope it has a bunch of slides, because this will be a lot of fun for our kids to go down. And I hope one of them is red, because my six-year-old likes the color red. And my second thought was, well, what if we took a similarly open and collaborative approach with designing a project here so that we could all be proud of it, and we could have something that's a national model that we invite people in from all over the country to come and see. And it was built here, and we did it. And everyone together in this room is proud of it. So thank you for your time. Are there other comments on the issue of size and scale of the project? I just want to ask, there was one question about the possibility of increasing the number of units after it was, this was brought up by a council person, increasing the number of units beyond 28 after a potential approval of the half million dollars. Do either one of you want to speak to that? It may be a very brief, thank you. We don't intend to increase the number of units at this site, whether a person could, between the point of a, a town commitment and 
a zoning process. I, I don't know the answer because I don't know what the commitment letter would look like. Um, ultimately, the ZBA is responsible for permitting it, and so that has a certain legal weight. Um, you know, usually if we have a funding commitment that's for a specific description and something changes, what we would do is go back to whoever gave us that funding commitment and discuss that change with them. It's usually pretty minor stuff. Um, but by the same token, I think the question is, if it's 28 units now and there's been considerable interest in shrinking the project, um, could we then, at the stage when we're discussing with the ZBA, have the authority to shrink the project? Um, I don't know that I know if you guys have an experience with a project that morphs. <laughs> yeah. I think we'd have to go back to whatever authority had granted us funds and have that conversation with them. Um, but since you've raised the question, is it possible to shrink this project from 28 to something lower? Um, I think that there are cost implications with any changes that we would make. And I don't feel like it's, I can answer kind of spur of the moment. I think anything that we've talked about, changing the unit mix, changing the number of units, uh, changing the staffing plan for the property, we have to look at how we would finance that. Um, I, so I don't know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments at this time on the issue of size and scale? Moving on to the, I'm sorry, please. Robert Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, two questions that arise around the question of size and scale. <coughs> Given the, the size of the units of 240 square feet, it seems to me that uh, for many of the units it will be seen as transitional housing, meaning that people will take it because it's available and nothing else is available um, at that price. But to the extent that there are any possibilities of moving to another unit which uh, is larger, which, is, which would allow them to have uh, a maid, children, any number of possibilities, um, they would want to move on. And so one of the things that you have to just consider in this is that it is likely to be transitional for a great number of people. That's not a bad thing, but just recognize that that is likely to be the way it would work. Um, the second is <coughs> that there is nothing wrong with housing uh, people in this location. Um, I don't have any issues with, with the idea of it being, uh, for the most part, single units. Um, there has been some discussion about the naming of it. Um, I don't really care whether it's called an SRO or whether it is called a studio apartment. Um, but uh, I've, I've dealt with these things over my career um, for 50 years. Um, and there's clearly going to be some, well, let me put it this, this way. Uh, it is not an insult to call it an SRO. And it has been described as being an insult. Um, more conversations, more openness about the way people talk about it is important. I agree with Connie. I agree with lots of people here. Um, this has got to be the beginning of discussions. It's got to be the way in which projects in the future are considered. Don't worry about people who say, I don't like the way you did it. Let's just talk about ways that we can make it better. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the issue? All right, then we are going to move on to the screening of tenants selection and the typical tenant issues. 
and what happens if you don't fill the slots? Comments? Questions? Come for you may speak because it's a new issue. I'm sorry, there's somebody back here. Let me get that person first. Thank you. I didn't see your hand, sir. Come, up, come forward. So my name is Robert Ryan. I'm chair of the Interfaith Housing Board, which is a nonprofit group based here in Amherst. Uh, we're over 30 years old. Uh, we helped start Village Housing up in North Amherst. And we supported many of the affordable housing projects we built in town through seed funding. Um, and we support this project. And the reason we support this project, we support lots of different projects in town, but what I really like about this project is it has a mix of income for people, of different, different ability to pay for this. And that's what makes it, I think, a unique project compared to maybe others that might be proposed for the site or other sites in town. And I think that's very important because, as was mentioned before, it allows people that work for the town to live in the town. People that are teacher's aides, people that work in the library, people that work in town government, people that work on the public works department, people that can actually live in the town they work in, which they can not have. It also allows people that are in transition to find a place, but I think what you find is these income levels, there's not gonna be a, a shortage of people that will want to apply to these. In fact, there'll be a long waiting list of people that wanna live in these because there's so few affordable housing units in Amherst. Our group has looked for housing sites uh, for projects like this in town for at least eight years and had much trouble finding them. Why? Because we live in a town with student housing. So there's lots of competition for these units. There's lots of competition for apartment units in this town, which is why this is, to me, a very good project um, to support. And to me, it's the mix of units that make it Attractive. And the other part is looking at the architectural renderings. I also have a professional degree in landscape architecture and planning. And, and the, to me, the renderings speak a lot about the character of what this building will be. We've worked with the, the uh, site developer before on other projects, and their projects are top rate. Right. They fit into the neighborhoods they're in, they have good management, um, and they've been good neighbors. So our group supports this project. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Addition, yes, there's one way in the back, please. Hi, I don't know if I'm the only homeless person here. Mm -hmm. However, I, I definitely support the project. Um, and I have something to address the screening. And as Bob Marley said, there's so much things to say right now. There's so much things to say. But you know, diversity means a lot of things. Income, there's definitely, I'm glad to hear that there's gonna be a diverse, but diversity, it means a lot of different things. Like a lot of different people shouldn't be lumped together necessarily. I'd like to see some theme complexes, like you get to live here no matter what your income is. If you don't throw cigarette butts, nip bottles, you care about sustainable lawn care, and you don't use scented products. Um, you know, it, it, it just, you can be really low income and low life, or. Uh, or not. Okay, so I wrote all over the place before I knew there were going to be categories. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important this project because I'm going to quote and change it around from Barbara Ehrenreich. One thing I've learned though, a gap of any kind for any purpose, child raising, caring for an elderly patient, recovering from illness, blah, blah, blah. If you haven't spent every moment of your life making money for anyone else, you can forget about getting a job. I would say also if you don't make enough money, you can forget about getting an apartment. It seems like the area really favors students for various reasons. Um, so it, 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 it's needed. However, it does seem like that there's an incredible number of dysfunctional people, and I'm glad to hear there's gonna only be eight homeless, because I think when people talk about homeless, th that category can't be a category. A behavior has to be a category. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it does seem to be that there are a lot of people who uh, have, I better look at my notes. Um, when material conspiracy is on the face is false, it might be you who are wandering lost, wondering how much does this tend to cost, how much does the rent to God you preach the tent to cost. Taskmasters, ma task mass traveling, lying, free falls, deep descent, long lost as a matter of long term denial, short term profit styles turning. The awareness of ha housing is important. Okay, so if you're gonna get a mix, 
Um, you know, it's enough to be displaced or lose everything or if you're someone who ended up homeless. But there's a lot of people who are homeless that are in the category of people who might have made, like in other words, people who are the terrible word victim of bad behavior don't necessarily want to share a place with the type of person who is the perpetrator. So not everyone wants to live, per okay, this is important, monitoring. If you're already lost everything, the last thing you want to have is a babysitter or be monitored. I think people should address the already existing conflicts that have all the calls, that the management's not monitored or the behavior. I don't think it's wise to, I think the individuals need monitoring. I don't think it needs on-site management. Personally, I don't want to live where there needs to be monitoring. I feel like people should be allowed to live there who are self-monitored, mm -hmm. and if need, they're not, I need you they to wrap should up. have individual help, not the whole place. Mm -hmm. Like, suddenly you're low income, now you're basically being babysat. However, mm -hmm. there is a need for housing, and I heard CDC does good things, but I really feel like it's not okay to just drop people off. I am so tired of dealing with dysfunction and drunks and drug addicts and it seems like there is n it's okay here and it's okay to subsidize it and I can see why there's very good reasons for people and it might be working for them but it doesn't work for other tenants who might be in the same category so that I'm glad to hear there'll be a diverse category please don't put a babysitter there please screen the people individually thank and you. get them a monitor personally thank you uh -huh. Are there any further comments on the issue of screening and discussion of tenant selection procedures, et cetera? Yes. Can you be brief, given that you've already spoken? Thank you. I don't know if I can get an answer, but um, I was also at one of the- uh, Please use sorry. the mic. Sorry. Um, my question is screening. My understanding was that in the application, um, the first round, a certain percentage of those would be from residents that lived in Amherst, or perhaps was lived or work. But once that, once those people leave, that the next time it would just be open statewide. And I'm just asking if that is in fact okay. how it would work. I, I actually would like to ask Valley CDC to talk specifically about screening in this case. One addressing the issue of percentage from Amherst, and the other one, another one, particularly is the issue of if you don't hit the targets for the various percentages, do you lower the target? Thank you. Joanne Campbell, Valley CDC. Uh, so the, the first question about the, um, the preference initially when the project is completed, <clears throat> if the zoning board, the town so chooses to put a preference here, the, ta the state would look at the request by the state and uh, by the town and determine whether um, they would give up to a 70% preference for live or work in Amherst. Um, that's, and additionally, so there's lotteries that are held and so there'd be a lottery for Amherst folks and then there would be a lottery for the general population, anyone else, and all the Amherst folks who live or work in Amherst also go into the general pool. So mm -hmm. a higher chance of, mm -hmm. of um, being chosen to live in the development. And then after that initial lottery, then everyone who was on that list is on the wait list for the property. And anyone who chooses to put their name on the wait list comes after all the people who are in the lottery and there is not a local preference after that. So if I want to put my name, I live in Northampton, I want to put my name on that list, but I'm after the initial lottery folks. Okay, and then as the, you know, as the as people move out, if people don't move out for five years, the, the list could get stale, people found other housing, um, but it's not limited after that to just, to, you know, a 70% Amherst. Okay. Did, I want to make sure that for those of you on the council that screening. Screening. the screening could you, sorry? Could could you screening. speak more about screening screening of tenants yes okay so I mean we have stuff up on the website so uh, property management is for the lottery or for the screening once someone's when someone applies. once someone applies and you're now deciding, so deciding can that they're gonna yes move forward. so 
uh, HMR, which is the property management company, uh, does a uh, credit check. They, and basically they're doing a credit check for make sure people um, don't have utility um, bills because sometimes people can't turn on utilities. In this particular development, all the utilities are included. Mm -hmm. um, and they do a quarry check, so sex offenders are um, eliminated, uh, people with violent uh, histories, people who are dealing drugs, anyone who's uh, was making methamphetamine, there's some federal guidelines. So those people are screened out right from the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, and uh, then they do five, five years of landlord-tenant um, background. Um, if someone didn't have a landlord, they would talk to service providers and get references from service providers. The 50, 80? The 50, the 50, 80, the 80, 80, 50, 30. So uh, if, if we were seeking funding from the state and our guidelines were, or our affordable housing restriction would say that so many people have to be at 30% or less of median, so many people have to, have to be up to 50%, and so many people need to, to be up to 80. So um, since the 50 and 80 units are self-pay, meaning people have to have enough income, so someone who was making $18,000 couldn't be able to afford to pay what the rent is scheduled to be for someone you know, making 80%. I guess the question, I, I believe the question is, what if you cannot find enough applicants at the 80% who are willing to move into that? Uh, we would continue to look for people. In other words, you would not reduce the no. percentage no. and the number of people in that target. Okay. And I can, I can say just for an example on the, the lumber yard, which in, in mm -hmm. the, that there are certainly always in these lotteries a lot of very mm -hmm. low income people and so those units are mostly 60% units mm -hmm. but we have a, a high level of people who are very low income. We actually of the 447 um, applicants we actually had to go beyond that to find folks to fit the 60% units so we just we, we can't because the rents don't match. We don't want people spending more than 30% of their income so we would just have to work harder to get to, um, find to find tenants that fit okay. in those categories. And do you continue to keep those categories the way they are over time? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. most likely in perpetuity. <coughs> okay, hold on. Yes, Shalini. And I just want to clarify what I understood last time we spoke is that this, the people who, uh, who apply and get in have to be recertified every year. Yes, yeah. they're income certified every year. Yeah. That not necessarily asked to leave, but we do income qualification every year. Okay. It, it works more so for the people at thirty percent because mm -hmm. people are paying a portion, you know, of their income, and so that number would change based on the mm -hmm. subsidizing agency. But everyone is income certified okay. every year. It's required. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kathy. Hi, just staying on the ratios, the rates you have for each category, if you want to continue to search for the 80%, if that's the number. You know, I was looking at the way your budget is set up. You are on a very thin margin over several years with a low uh, basic assumption of not much of a vacancy. So are, is your experience that you can usually find them fairly quickly? Because it doesn't look like you can let these go empty for very long. Years of property management going out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a. I'm going to look at Laura. There is a operating uh, subsidy. Yeah. yeah. yeah I so I'm asking. You know, if you can't find them at the. The. Sure, the when the income goes up, people are paying more, and yeah. and they're paying more for a small place. So if you don't fill at the higher income level, you're you're losing so, some rent. Right. So, uh, and just to back up, so before we go official with something like this, we would need to do a market study. So we would look at the demand for rents at different levels, and as well as the people's income. And we would look at an absorption rate and a, and a, a saturation rate. And at this price point in Amherst, 
we feel like we will have very long wait lists at all of the different income levels um, because there really isn't much comparable. And so, yeah, you may only be paying 20% of your income for rent, but you can't go somewhere else necessarily and have rent that's affordable. You might want this walk to town location. Um, we don't anticipate having a shortage of tenants at any of the income levels, and we would verify that assumption through a market study. And I think we'll be looking at very low percentages, you know, that we might have to capture, you know, five percent of the market to fill these units. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a challenge in that way. Before you sit down, are there other questions on this issue from the council? Yes, Darcy. I just have one question about um, the people who are going to live there who are formerly homeless. Um, how how are you going to Don't hold the button down. Oh, <laughs> that's new. <laughs> just the opposite um, of normal. <laughs> Um, how are you going to certify that they live or work in Amherst? If they... Uh, <laughs> Some people who are homeless are, are I mean, they're going to give their residence as Amherst just like they do at the shelter. Some people are doubled up with family. They're living in Amherst. If you work in Amherst, we can get your pay stub and see that you work in Amherst. I mean, there are people checking into Craig's doors who are employed. They are work in Amherst. They're walking there. So I think in general, will there be a method that we can use to try to establish that someone is residing in Amherst? I, I guess I oops, did it again. <laughs> I, um, I, I, uh, I almost feel like it doesn't necessarily need to be a qualification for that group because our homeless population is so transient, you know. It's, it, that it, could work through the, the zoning process, but I was going to also just add that people, if, if they have a mailing address, you know, for their social security check, or for their, uh, you know, th their identification on a license, even if they're not driving, that would show some. A post office box in Amherst. Let me, I, I'm sorry, but I want to hear, I want to make sure other people are hearing what you're saying, and that is providers also have the information as to where people, quote, are living. And exactly, okay. Are there other issues regarding this particular topic? Okay, I'd like to move on, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, one more back here, Jerry Weiss. Hi, I'm, I'm Jerry Weiss. I'm the president of the board of uh, Craig Stores, and I've worked um, on homeless issues in Amherst for probably 13 years. I just wanted to make a, a comment about uh, providers and the homeless. Um, uh, it's likely that anybody who applies in the lottery uh, at, that is homeless would be known by the staff at Craig Stores. Uh, I'd be surprised if we didn't know them pretty well. And um, we can certainly tell you whether they're red home ready. Not all people who are homeless are ready to be in a home, but many are, and there are many who are ready who cannot find a home. They just aren't out there. Um, I just, I have a lot more to say, but I'll try to stick to the topic. Um, this past season, Craig Stores housed 172 separate individuals over the course of the winter. That's not 172 bed nights, that's 172 separate people. Um, we turned away 193 people over a six month period. And we've only been able to house 11 of those 172 individuals over the past year. Um, I I don't know how many people know what the main cause of homelessness is in this country. Mm. It's lack of affordable housing. Mm. That's the primary cause of homelessness. And um, I just want to say that this project, it's, it's, it's almost too good to be true. 
when we see the checklist of what what uh, Valley CDC is uh, trying to accomplish with um, the siting and the income levels, you know, um, a variety of income levels does raise all boats. And um, we don't want to ghettoize anyone and stick them all in one area of town. Um, this is this is unbelievable, this project of three different income levels um, supported by Valley CDC, supported by Craig Stores, uh, Community Connections, Elliott Services, uh, the Amherst Police and Fire Department, who have been extremely helpful in uh, supporting Craig Stores. Um, we are a behavioral-based shelter. Um, if you behave, you can stay there. That's the rule. We don't care what condition you're in as long as you obey the rules and we treat other people with respect. So we have a long history with, with behavior. Um, I have much, I can say a lot more, but um, Thank that's sticking to this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other comments regarding tenant selection procedures? I'm, I'm sorry, filling okay. slots. Yes, Lev. The woman coming up here is Lev Benezra. In just full disclosure, I have been on the Emerson Survival Center, active at the Emerson Survival Center for 10 years, on the board and president for the last three, and continue in that capacity, but not as board chair. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm Lev Benezra, and I'm really lucky to be able to serve as the executive director at the Immer Survival Center. And um, as folks have been speaking, I um, know lots of the houses, the, the addresses that have been listed, because my very first job was delivering papers on those <laughs> several streets. Um, so I am here to express my strong support on behalf of the Immer Survival Center of this project as it currently stands. And the Amherst Survival Center's support for this affordable housing project is based on three key points, need, opportunity, and reward, all of which circle around this question of tenant selection. So I think it's really important for us to recognize that the criteria for people to live in these properties is that they have lower incomes, is that currently, at this time, they do not make enough in this community to afford other rentals. That is the selection process. There are a number of other measures that have been spoken to by Valley CDC regarding safeguards to make this property safe for the whole group of people who are there, as well as abutting neighbors. But what qualifies someone to live in affordable housing is that they don't make enough money to rent housing elsewhere. So need, I think, is the area where we all agree. We know that there's a critical need for affordable housing, and in fact that the shortage locally and in this part of the state is worse than the state as a whole. It's been referenced here that median wages for cashiers, nursing assistants, and teacher's aides are roughly half of what is required for a single wage earner to afford a studio apartment in this area. Supervisors in retail and full-time tractor trailer drivers still don't reach this threshold. So let's have that sink in for a moment, is that these hardworking neighbors would have to clock 60 to 100 hours a week at a job with benefits in order to afford, to afford a studio apartment in our area. That is what the tenant selection process is, are all of those folks who care for us in the hospital, who bring extra snacks to the soccer practice. There are the folks who, provide our kids with one-on-one -on -one attention um, at school, and they are many of us in this room, either currently or at other times in our lives. The opportunity to serve these tenants who are selected through this process is that we're here, that we live in a community where we see this need with so much support, whatever questions and concerns are raised, and that we have the resources to connect the dots. And those resources are a site which has been identified and selected and purchased. Lev, you an need to finish up. Okay. An amazing community organization who has the skills to put this into place. So my last point is the reward. And the reward is for all of us. 
because affordable housing is the foundation upon which people can build a stable and thriving life. So at the Amherst Survival Center, we, s we see regularly what it means when people don't have this, and we see what it means when they do. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to also add that when we had this discussion at the Survival Center, I recused myself from the discussion. Lev, thank you. Are there other comments at this time? Yes. Are we still talking about the, the percentages? The selection, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I just have one quick question. Should I go, go up to the Please. Okay. So my name is Amy Gilbert Loinez. I live at 14 Orchard Street. And I just wanted to ask Laura Baker a question. Because at the last, um, I believe, finance committee meeting, um, she had talked about there being a ceiling but no floor to income. And so we understood that as meaning that those slots would open up to lower income tenants or ap applicants should those not be filled. So I just wanted to pose that. Let's question. make that further clarification. Thank you. I should have asked you to sit over here this today. So uh, unlike the hard and fast ceiling that are these income limits, mm -hmm. there may not be a hard and fast floor. It really, the floor is really driven by a person's ability, in this case, single person household, um, to afford the rent that's being charged. And so as Joanne said, we're looking for someone who has the ability to pay the rent that's being charged and only spend 30% of their income for that rent. And so the window, which is called the window in our field, is that's the floor, is people have to have enough money to be able to afford the rent. And then the ceiling is that cap that's set at whatever it is, 50% or 80% AMI. It's desirable to have a wide window because more people can fit through. And so we're trying to hold the rents as low as possible, honestly, and make the project financially viable so that we can make that window as broad as possible so as many people can fit through as possible. Does that answer your question? Yes. Just one yep. Can you Please stand up so that we can at least hear you. Yeah, there's a possibility someone would have a voucher who's earning up to 50% of the area median income. We don't think that would occur with someone earning up to 80% of the area median income. Um, and just a quick comment on vouchers. Um, Kate had mentioned in her presentation that people would need to bring vouchers to the 30% units. Um, that's not correct. We're proposing to apply for those vouchers from the state when we apply for most of the financing, and they would basically live in the property. So whoever comes into the property benefits from the voucher, they leave, the next person comes in and they benefit. So people don't need to bring the voucher. Um, there are 10, 12 project-based vouchers proposed for, for this property. Okay, on this subject, are there any other questions before I, Laura sits down again? Yes, please in the back. So um, it's not a sober house. People can use or imbibe things that are legal. Uh, illegal drugs are not permitted on the property. Um, and at our current similar properties, the policy is we do not allow overnight guests. Um, I don't think we've gotten to that level of detail in designing this project, but that's what we have done at other properties. We've said no overnight guests. Okay. Other questions on this issue back there? Sure. Thank. So 
Thank you. Let her answer the question. Thank you. So, uh, as is happening with affordable housing everywhere, this would be a non smoking building. It's really about secondhand smoke, whether it's from cigarettes or marijuana. People can use edibles if they have a medical prescription for those, but it's non smoking in the building, and it's not a judgment uh, about lifestyle, it's really about secondhand smoke. Excuse me. Thank you. Are there any other questions or issues around this particular topic? Brief, since you've spoken before. No. She's already qualified. She's answered the question. The answer is no, you cannot do that. Am I correct? Sure. Once this is formalized, we will actually have a deed restriction from the town of Amherst that will specify those income tiers. It's something that's pretty written in stone, um, and it typically goes for 99 years. The rent amount for the 80% units would be higher than the 50% the units. So again, we're looking for people with the ability to pay at that higher rent. I'm sorry, I, I really cannot continue to allow people to just dialogue. If you have a question, please stand up, raise your hand, and let me recognize you. Stand up. Does the rent go up for the cost of living? So the cost of living goes yeah. up, does yeah. the rent go up as well? Yes. The, the short answer is yes. Um, with the 30% the, uh, units, we're bound to HUDs. Um, they publish every year what rents can be charged. Um, with the 50% and 80%, we could increase those gradually over time. We would need to um, in order to keep up with expenses. Okay, thank you. Maybe we'll let you sit down for a minute. Okay, please sit down right there. Um, we've really kind of exhausted this one, and uh, there's been a lot of questions around the issue of support and live-in staff. And this might also be an opportunity for people who have worked with others or been tenants in similar facilities. Sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Don Perry. I'm a Valley CDC board member been a part of that Valley for about 15 years. I'm also a former SRO. I worked in a former SRO outreach program in Northampton in uh, collaboration with Valley CDC. I'm currently a consultant at UMass Medical for behavioral uh, health, justice involved individuals. But one of the things I want to talk about is, the gentleman spoke earlier about his experience in the SRO. That was in Turner's. I know from personal experience, from working in Northampton, in all of the SRO, Bridge Street, Florence, all of them, first of all, one of the things that hasn't been talked about, we talked about the services. When tenants go into SROs in uh, Northampton through Valley CDC, there's service connected through the SRO. You have like um, individual service providers, right? They have clinicians, they, they make sure that they are connected. In that, one of the things that we did in Northampton, we could create a monthly or regular meeting where the service providers and everyone collaborate. Because rather than dupl duplicate one another's efforts, we complement one another's efforts. So, and <clears throat> people talk about having uh, on-site supervision. How many people? How many people in this room want their privacy invaded every day? Right? That's not treating. That's not respecting people as adults or human beings. So what we do, what we do do, what Valley do is, then uh, through the SRO outreach, someone is connected with those facilities every week. I set up a coffee hour where people go in and coffee hour where you can connect with tenants. Someone mentioned earlier about tenants being transitioned. That's not true either, because one, it's hard for people to finally get into housing. You heard the, the young lady speak, uh, Pam, earlier, about how she left Bridge Street 
and though it's under renovation, she's waiting to go back. These, this, these SROs become people's families, their homes. This is where they live long term, right? And I know this from personal experience. Uh, someone uh, mentioned earlier about some concerns about children. Bridge Street is right abutting a school, an uh, elementary school with children. There's never been an incident. The only incident is kids throwing a ball across the fence, can you throw it back? <laughs> or can you come over and play with me? You know what I'm saying? So all this, this fear mongering, right, and this hatred, right, venom is venom, right? These people, these are human beings and they deserve a place to live also. And once they get into housing, right, they are service connected, right? And the tenants, the tenants in and of itself, they want safe places to live, right? And we, Valley has a community engagement committee. I'm a part of that too. And one of the things we, the strategy behind that is to try to encourage the individual to become invested in their housing, in their community. We want them to, to uh, plant flowers, to, be, to get involved in you know, committees and all this kind of stuff. But thank you. But I just wanted you to understand that there's other layers to this that we're not talking about. And there will be service connected. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, sir. Hey everyone. So my name's Jay Levy. I'm with Elliott uh, CHS Homeless Services. I'm also a resident in Amherst and I've been working with folks uh, without homes uh, for over 30 years now. And I gotta say, um, it's been a blessing over the last five years to see some of the housing development that has gone down in some of the other areas, particularly uh, Northampton and giving some of these folks that have been out there for so long uh, the chance to get inside. Um, unfortunately, we had, uh, I think, three deaths over the last year and a half, people that we know well in the homeless community, and we've done uh, services and memorials for them. And we've gotten a lot of attendance from people, concerned citizens in Amherst, to come out to those things. Um, so I want to invite a dialogue. Uh, this is not to say, I know everyone's for affordable housing, which is great. And I want to vouch for Valley CDC. I've, I've worked with them on several projects, whether it's out in um, uh, the Bridge Street project or King Street or Go West. Those are three that I can name off the top of my head that we work very closely with. We've placed several people in there. Uh, the thing with services to understand, and Don was touching on this before, is the services goes with the person. <coughs> so as opposed to the services being directly connected to the project, when all the screening is done and when people are looking at functional levels and what people can handle and, and how to make a match into housing, that's done with a concern and an eye toward what type of support service is needed. And then people might say, well, where would those support services come from and how would they be funded? Well, there's Medicaid dollars. There's HUD COC support services. There's DMH dollars. There's SAMHSA dollars. There's dollars that we get at Elliott CHS Homeless Services to provide transitional. So I know I'm not necessarily gonna convince people to change their mind, but I wanna at least flesh out the support service, no matter what the decision is, just to know in the back of your heads and back of your minds that people aren't gonna be just thrown into the housing without that kind of support. When they do the lottery that's gonna come up, all of the providers are gonna be notified about that lottery, and we're gonna line up the people we're working with that are homeless around Amherst, around Hampshire County, <coughs> to get into that lottery. And then from there, uh, we're gonna be available to talk about the support service structure and how that'll work. So this is something that'll happen later on. It's been modeled already in Northampton, as Don mentioned. Uh, we've done it with provider meetings with everyone around the table talking about how we can better support people, be proactive, respond to community concerns, uh, and I think it's worked out very, very well uh, overall. I can, I can say that and I'm genuine about that. It's, we haven't had that much problems with neighborhoods and neighbors and people complaining and all of that. And when that does happen, it's addressed. So I need to thank you for your comments. You. Okay. Are there other comments with regard to support, live-in staff, people who have experience? I'm going to go back to the back to somebody who's not spoken. Thank you. Hello.
Hello, my name is Priscilla White, and I'm an Amherst resident. And um, a number of years ago, I started the SRO Outreach Project in Northampton. Um, so I'd like to talk about two things. One, why that project got started, and two, um, just to, to give people sort of um, a sense of my experience working in the SROs with the residents there. Um, the project got started because sometimes um, a lot of people who have limited income uh, run into a snag, a bureaucratic snag in their income, and they lose um, a benefit. That when I first was um, approached to form this SRO outreach project, I was scared. It's like, whoa, what's it going to be like going into these places um, and uh, meeting with a lot of people that I didn't know and um, had some stereotypes about. It turned out that um, my stereotypes were really wrong. And I met many, many people who, uh, who were the kind of person that you would want to have as a friend, as a neighbor. Um, the kind of help that they needed was help around budgeting, help trying to get access to health services. Priscilla, please wrap up. Um, the kind of things that we all grapple with. And so with a little bit of support, which was less than 20 hours a week, because I was managing a number of programs, um, people were able to thrive and maintain their stability in the SRO outreach project, in the um, SROs. So um, just don't want you to underestimate Thank. the value of t a 20 hour a week on site SRO um, support service. Thank you for your comment. Are there other comments that have people who have not spoken at this point? Please. That's okay. Hello again. My name is Amy Gilbert Loinez, and I live at 14 Orchard Street. As background, I've spent over 15 years in public health programming. I have a designed and evaluated programs for people living in extreme poverty in the southern Appalachian region and in many countries, including Haiti and El Salvador. After reading the proposal, I feel that the construction costs are very detailed for this project, but programmatic costs are ad hoc or secondary. With a limit of 20 hours a week of on-site, non-clinical staff, the proposed level of support is inadequate to meet the needs of the most vulnerable residents. Clinical support has not been detailed, but is documented by Valley CDC to be roughly one, one visit per week. Although the developer states that they will provide supportive service plan at a later time, the town needs to see a detailed proposal of services or a probability model now, including projected costs, so that we can understand what Amherst is really being asked to contribute. In a benchmark 2011 policy paper, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council stated that the recovery from the trauma of homelessness with or without the comorbidities of substance abuse and mental illness is a cyclical process with expected decompensation from previously needed adaptive skills. For those with substance abuse challenges, relapse is a part of the natural process. This must be addressed in a multi-year timeline of support. The developer's one metric of 12 months in housing is not sufficient to measure successful housing stability. Clinicians have consistently called for increased support hours to truly achieve desired outcomes. This is not a housing first initiative, the main purpose of which is to get people housed quickly, regardless of their ability to live independently. But it is a permanent, it is, a, um, it is an example of permanent supportive housing. Once residents are in place, Valley CDC then has a responsibility to care for their complex needs. It also must, also must be flexible to address fluctuations in individual need and the number of residents requiring services. 
According to HUD guidelines of evidence-based best practices, financial flexibility is critical to program success. How will this be funded? Will it fall on the town of Amherst to supplement this, given the uncertainty of other funding? Funding is provided at the state and national levels, and the developer agrees that it can be volatile, dependent on annual review and reinstatement. They've spoken of a reserve to cover building maintenance and a property manager, but have not addressed self-funding a continuation of services. If its service provider's budgets are cut, what happens? Currently, services are reduced and, or discontinued. No one would believe that Valley CDC would want this to happen, but would Amherst step in to ensure continuity of care? If this proposal is approved as is, the town may be obligated to supplement the project indefinitely, just as Northampton supplements its SROs. I need you to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Is Amherst able to take on this level of financial responsibility? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this particular issue at this time? What's the issue? The issue that we are talking about at this point was the whole issue of support and live-in staff and the um, at that point we've been also hearing from people who talk about residents. Yes. I, I'm sorry, but we've really heard from you several times tonight. I, I understand that. Excuse me. There was no services at that apartment complex, and we were harassed and doing social services work 24 7 at the North End of the apartment. Pretty much unpaid because there was people were just dropped off. And he can tell you the story that he's now gone for a year. He can write a book on what we did just being in the neighborhood because no one else was and it had to be done. And, and I think CDC and all these people can make sure that that won't happen. Thank you. <coughs> right, are there any other comments on the, the whole issue of um, support and live-in staff? I'm gonna move on to any other comments we've already heard from the Chief of Police, we've already discussed public safety. Is there any other final comments on that area? Gentleman right here. I'm Jeff Lee, <coughs> resident of Amherst. And I'd just like to say a few words uh, that may allay some fears about the two Department of Mental Health units in this plan. Uh, I spent my formative years, age 5 through 17, um, growing up on the grounds of a state mental hospital where my father worked. Uh, my three younger brothers lived there, grew up there as well. And many of the uh, patients there were far more seriously mental ill than the people that would qualify for this um, apartment complex. Um, for me, it was far from a, a fearful experience. It was really an enriching experience. Um, I got to know, over time, many of the patients on a first-name basis, and I really developed an appreciation for um, the challenges of mental illness. And um, about 50 years ago, Massachusetts began deinstitutionalizing. Um, Northampton State Hospital was closed, Belchertown State School was closed. Uh, the theory being that it's more humane, more effective, more economical to integrate the mentally ill into the community wherever possible. Um, so uh, the success of that process really depends on there being places for the mentally ill to live. And um, as far as I know, there's really no comparable units in Amherst where um, low-income, mentally ill people <coughs> can live and get services. So um, I thank CDC for including uh, DMH um, <coughs> units in this project, and I support it. Thank you. Are there other comments with regard to public safety and emergency services? <coughs> mm. Please come forward. So um, 
I'm a victim of domestic violence and I don't necessarily want to give you my address, but there are people in here who know my name. And if you really need it, I can- Please proceed. Help. Okay. So in the fall of 2016, the Amherst Survival Center awarded me the Corporation for National and Community Services Lifetime Achievement Award for completing more than 4,000 hours of service to that organization. Um, it was really a special thing. It was signed by Barack Obama. And I bring it up, not because I'm great, but I am, but because I've been with members of this sort of population that you're grouping together for a long time, probably a decade. Um, I've served a lot of those individuals in that capacity. I've taken time in my own life to drive people to hospitals and visit people in hospitals and try to help people get housing and every kind of thing you can imagine. Just there's a need, there's a small staff there, if I can help, I do. So I feel like I'm close to them. I'm also a graduate of Smith College. My first husband is an Amherst alum. I have a career on Wall Street. I mean, I have a background that's extensive in policy. I understand CDC. I know where the funding from the banks come from. I understand how local banks get access to that. I have a huge background um, that I could bring to this. But I just want to try to focus on the reason I'm here. The professors that wrote in objecting to this a month ago from Amherst about Pratt Field really just. Excuse me. You need to be careful about what you say about people. OK. So this was in the Daily Hampshire Gazette? It doesn't matter. So it's you I, speaking here. So what should I not say? Anything that's derogatory or points to an individual. OK. So whoever was anonymous that wrote the letters are why I'm here, because I think they're off base about the population. Um, I want to thank. Dina Rubin, Morian, Morian Adams, the League of Wo the Women Voters, and the Gazette for their editorial, and Nicola Usher, because I feel like in the last month there have been incredible responses to this, and also the Valley CDC response, which is on the website, which explains a lot of this. And if people have read it, that's good, I think. Um, so the people in districts three and four. So regarding the first two pages, there were concerns about safety and interaction with students. Um, specifically grouping everyone that may live in this property in, you, in the same You need to begin wrapping up. I you, have, you have a limit. Okay. Everyone yeah. has the same limit. Okay. So the concern was that Pratt Field was going to get closed if there were altercations or conflicts with these residents. And I find that really elitist and also kind excuse of, me I, this yeah can i i thought I, I, my life is a danger to speak here and this is really important to me and i've waited like four hours are you really going to ask me to leave first because of all your time is up okay and second of all we're we'd like you to refrain from using words that suggest classifying people that's what they did in the article. That is what they may have done, but that is not we are, what we are doing here tonight. Okay, so am I supposed to say something positive? You're supposed to finish up because your time is up. Okay. Wow. Okay. So I think the college is encouraging the students to work with people that are disadvantaged, and I've seen that, and I think that's positive. It's happened at the Survival Center. They send their athletic department sends athletes over to work with, with people that are disadvantaged. A lot of organizations, dammers, come over to the survival center and work with this population. So I just felt like it was sort of out of touch. That's why I'm here. Um, and so so I hope, thank you for your comments. I hope you'll think about that. Are there other comments at this point on the issue of public safety and emergency? Yes. was stated here tonight and allowed to be stated by the president of the council that the, that if these building, if this um, SRO project goes ahead, Pratt Field will be closed. It was a clear statement made. I can name the speaker if you want. 
I was allowed to go through. I'm very troubled with the way this whole meeting has been arranged where, where people at 10 o'clock at night are being cut off after three minutes when a half hour and more, because it was extended past half an hour, was given to uh, supposed abutters, some of whom live on Amity Street, uh, and the entire thing for, for the council, for the press, the impression has been given that Amherst, you know, the, the, there wasn't a balanced presentation at all. And now you've cut off a woman who came here and as she said, waited this long to respond to something that has been said in the paper and in this room. It's very troubling. People here have claimed they're being victimized because of their opposition to this project, but the people who would live in this project have been victimized over and over again in the press, in comments to the council, in comments in this room, yet you've allowed that. It's unequal, it's unfair, it's unacceptable. Are there any other comments at this time? Yes. Um, I would like to say I disagree. You, I'm sorry. If you need to speak, you need to come forward. The limit's three minutes. Yes. My name is Gay Pistol, and I live at 72 Dana Street. And I have to say that this group of people have spent hours and hours of their time listening to both sides of our issues, and I think they should not be publicly humiliated that way. I commend all of you for your time and efforts and listening and bringing us all together. We have two different views. I have some concerns. The one thing that I have learned about all of us is that we are all, every single one of us, are all for affordable housing. So thank you very much for the opportunity tonight. And um, I hope we can all work together. And please stop slanderous, I mean, I have to say the one thing that I am disappointed about this whole uh, issue be careful. Is, is I just, I worry that we're in a community, a special community, that we have the opportunity to work together and it's not happening. So let's all think about this. But thank you for your, for your work. Thank you. Yes, Pat. I just wanted to say that I was not humiliated um, by Mr. Oldham's comments. I feel like um, critique of um, our how we work and what we're doing um, is important in whichever direction it comes from. We're finishing up on public safety and emergency and looking at the consideration of financial issues. Financial matters initial cost and plan for ongoing support. And the other question that goes with this is any legal issues. Yes. Good evening, my name is Felicity Barry. I live in Amherst and I am a community development lawyer. I do this work for a living um, and I represent a number of uh, nonprofits um, in the Pioneer Valley that do these kinds of projects. Um, I wanted to address Ms. Haneke's uh, remarks. While I'm not aware of the particular metric that you are speaking of, I will say that uh, from my limited understanding about the project financials, specifically with respect to the construction costs, it does not appear to me that um, this project is out of whack um, or uh, different from any other a kind of affordable project that is developed uh, here in the Valley. And I want to spend just a minute or two explaining some of the factors that go into uh, why these projects are so expensive to build. Uh, first of all, there is a very extensive design process that um, involves civil engineering, architectural review, all of those plans are looked at not only within the um, within the organization and presented to the 
Zoning Board of Appeals in connection with the comprehensive permit process, but there's also design review that is undertaken by the state. Um, so the um, engineering and the, the civil engineering and the architectural work is um, extensively reviewed and that adds to the expense of the project. Another factor that is really uh, critical in these projects has to do with the length of time that they take to develop. Um, this project, as you've heard this evening, started quite some time ago with the site selection process and it's going to go uh, for many years uh, going out just to get the comprehensive permit and to go through the financing process. So uh, time is a significant factor when it comes to developing these projects. And then finally, there are the extra legal costs uh, that sometimes arise, maybe not uh, for this particular project, I hope not, uh, because I hope that the community uh, will eventually uh, get around to supporting the project uh, in a really constructive way. But it is true that these projects uh, do um, involve greater legal expenses because of the permitting, the lengthy permitting process, and sometimes the appeals that follow. So um, while I can't speak to Ms. Haneke's specific uh, questions, and perhaps Valley CDC can address that at a different time, I would say that this, uh, the, the budget for this project seems to be in line with other projects I've seen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir? Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Jessup, and um, I'm a board member at Valley CDC. And for a number of years, I was a member of the Community Preservation Act Committee and chaired that committee much longer than I probably should have. <laughs> and until very recently, I was a longtime resident of Amherst. Um, I currently serve on the CPA committee in Sunderland, and boy, is the lifting easy, relatively speaking. <laughs> so I want to thank you for your time tonight, but I do specifically want to talk for just a minute about the CPA uh, and that process. Um, some speakers have alluded to the fact that approval of the CPA by town council will um, be a de facto approval of the process in its current form, and I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the Zoning Board of Appeals process, and I've been involved in many of them over my 40-year career uh, in the business, um, I've been involved in many ZBA hearings, and that will be a rigorous process, I can guarantee you that. Uh, there'll be lots of opportunities for much more discussion on each of the individual items that we've covered tonight. So I would, I would urge the council to look at this in its broadest sense of support for the project. Um, I think it's reasonable to have specific concerns. I think you've addressed some of those tonight. I, I, I know that Valley will follow up with you as counselors to address those concerns. But I would urge you to support the CPA approval and let the process uh, take its place. I think you've heard great support, generally speaking, from the community. Uh, for the project. I know there are some concerns. I believe all of those will be addressed uh, during the, the process, uh, during the ZBA process, which in my experience in Amherst is nothing but rigorous. Um, additionally, I'd like to just briefly uh, remind you that you've received four letters of uh, support from uh, neighbors that abut Valley CDC's projects in, uh, in Northampton. Those have been included in your packet, so I'd urge you to read those uh, one more time. And finally, just a quick word on the costs involved in building affordable housing. I've been involved over my 40-year career in probably the development and construction of over 600 units of affordable housing in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Arizona. And I can tell you it is the most complicated, intensive, and expensive process that there is. I wish there was a better way. On a typical project, we might have anywhere from eight to 12 different funding sources, all of whom have their requirements. It's the most complex thing we can do. I wish, I wish we had a, a simpler system. It's just not the case, and that does tend to drive the cost. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I'm, let me take the gentleman over here that has had his hand up, and then also the people that are standing over here. My, my name is Tim, Tim Neal, and uh, I lived on Dana Street for about 20 years and now down at Amity Place. But I'm speaking as a former member of the Finance Committee of the town. 
And I was going to say many of the points that Peter just said, that what the Meyer saying, what the council is looking at is a budgetary approval for the $500,000, not getting into the weeds of the approval of the project, which is a completely different. That's the CB, it's ZBA and so on. And I would like to just echo that this project meets a significant criteria for the CPA for the allocation of funds that is affordable housing. It's a reasonable project. Uh, many of the projects that I've dealt with over many years uh, are comparable and what you're voting on is just a budgetary approval for the funds that meet criteria of the CPA and I, want, I would like you to make sure that you consider that and your decision process. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next. My name is Ginny Hamilton and I am an Amherst resident. I'm doing notes so I stay on topic. Um, I want to talk tonight with the, my hat on as the former executive director of the Fair Housing Center of Greater Boston. And two weeks ago, the bulletin printed a column in which I shared my positive experience of living across the street from a project similar to what Valley CDC is planning. And one of my intentions for that, uh, for sharing that experience, was to hopefully calm some of the concerns that some residents have about their future neighbors. And then what I want to speak more to tonight is to remind everyone, but particularly decision makers, so town council, planning board, ZBA members, about your legal ob obligation under anti-discrimination laws. Uh, a decade ago, one of my last responsibilities as the executive director of the Fair Housing Center was to train planning board and ZBA members in eastern Massachusetts about their civil rights obligations. And tonight, I don't have the benefit of that 45-minute training in PowerPoint, um, but I'd still like to be able to touch on some of those key points for you, um, and particularly to those of you in decision-making roles. So your actions related to housing are covered by the Federal Fair Housing Act. Passed in 68, the Federal Fair Housing Act bans discrimination based on race and national origin, but also on sex, religion, and handicap or disability, among other protected statuses. Massachusetts law is actually even older, dating back to the 1940s, and adds even more protected classes to that list. In 1990, the ADA further clarified the rights of people with disabilities, and 20 years ago this past Saturday, the Supreme Court, written by uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, handed down the Olmstead decision, and that was regarding community housing for people with disabilities, including mental health. In Olmstead, the Supreme Court stated that failing to house people with disabilities, and I quote, in the most integrated setting appropriate to their needs, end quote, violates the Americans with Disabilities Act. Our Constitution also protects free speech, so abutters can say, for example, that they prefer women rather than men living in the housing, or families instead of individuals with mental health disabilities or histories of substance abuse to live in this program. But for you as government officials, if you were to act on these opinions of some of the abutters, if you were to make a decision about who can live at 132 Northampton Road based on their sex or on their disability, to do so would run counter to the laws that protect housing choice. And imagine for a minute that this proposal was for tenants who were all immigrants or all Muslim. I trust you wouldn't hesitate to support the project, even if somebody in the community spoke out against it. You need to wrap up. Legally, supporting housing for people with disabilities is the same. So to close, the law is on your side to approve the funding for this project, to prioritize the support of those in need, and to use public funds for inclusion. So I encourage you to approve the seat. Thank, Thank you. Next. Good evening. Um, my name is Catherine Oppie, and I am co-chair of Amherst Forward, and my, my co-chair with another hat on uh, spoke just before me. Uh, but I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Amherst Forward's leadership team to express our wholehearted support for the Valley Community Development Corporation's studio apartments on Northampton Road as proposed. The develop, this development benefits from the support and thorough vetting of our Municipal Housing Trust, the Community Development Block Grant Committee, and the Community Preservation Act Committee. 
We value the work of these experts who recommend that this development move forward without further delay. Based on these recommendations and the urgent need for affordable housing in Amherst, Town Council should approve the CPA funding for this well-conceived and greatly needed project and as the next step toward making this project a reality. Please keep in mind that the proposed residents of this project are already part of our community. Based on similar projects, it is quite likely that the majority of the residents will be employed locally through their wages, although their wages aren't sufficient to pay market <coughs> rent near their jobs. Increasing the supply of affordable housing has proven time and time again to stabilize communities and not disrupt them. Furthermore, federal and state civil rights laws as my co-chair pointed out with her other hat on, prohibit housing discrimination based on disability, including mental health and substance abuse. Denying, delaying, or altering the project based upon concerns about, the, about integrating this population into the community runs counter to fair housing mandates. Your vote in favor of this project will be supported by civil rights laws and their moral imperatives. Housing affordability is a documented problem in our town and in our region and in our nation. Where we live determines our access to work, education, health care, and other stabilizing services, our children's learning environment, and our social opportunities. We are pleased that, this, that CPAC named the Valley CDC Studio Apartments as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Amherst. Again, we urge you to approve the CPA funding recommended without delay. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Tom Kegelman. I'm coming here as both a affordable housing developer with a lot of experience, probably 30 years. And I guess if you would count count the work I've done with uh, homeless shelters and soup kitchens before that, maybe 40 years, maybe I can catch up with Peter eventually, but um, it's been a long time and I've seen a lot of different projects and I've worked with a lot of developers and I just wanted to, I'm also on the Affordable Housing Trust with John, who we're so lucky to have, I really appreciate his help and support and leadership. But I would like to say that one of the things that's come out of what we've been hearing tonight is that there are concerns by a group of people, neighbors, um, who have legitimate concerns. And I just wanted to say that um, in the work that I've done with various communities in, in several states, um, that uh, there's a balancing act. And you guys often get put in the position of having to mediate those. But I just wanted to try to round it out a little bit. Not only do you have neighbors and public officials on the town level, you've got state officials who are very demanding and have very strict rules about what gets funded at what amount, in what numbers, under what conditions, and what designs, and who gets included. And my god, we spend months on management plans because DHCD wants it in a particular way, with a particular format, and a particular type of, of consideration, sometimes changing the rules as we go. And it's, it's a, an incredible, incredible hard job to do what Laura and Joanne are doing. I just, I can't even think about the number of pieces that you have to juggle together. And the neighbors are part of it and they have a real legitimate concern that needs to be addressed. They need to be part of that. But just as we want everybody in town to be able to work together, we have to appreciate what Joanne and Laura are trying to do, getting all those other pieces, those other groups that aren't represented here. And I'm leaving out probably the most important constituency of all, which is the homeless. They need to be considered in this process. And if this vote is delayed, if this uh, request is denied, they're going to wait another year mm -hmm. for something that they have been looking forward to for a long time. So I hope you'll vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments on this particular area? 
gentleman right here. Good evening. My name is Tim Adderidge. I live at 143 Northampton Road. I am in a butter to the CDC uh, proposed property. I, I rise to speak to the financial considerations of this project. Uh, I don't care who lives there. I don't care actually if it gets built or not, but I do care about the amount of money that the town is going to be obligated in order for this thing to go forward. As a disabled, handicapped senior citizen, I probably will, uh, within a few years, have to reside at that place because I won't be able to afford the taxes on my house that I've been living in for 47 years. But the, I would, I would hope that the council would seriously consider not funding the CPA proposal because if you've re read the papers today, the Amherst Fire Department responded to a fire at Amherst College and one guy showed up. Uh, I think that the monies that are being spent are, and will be spent over the years on this project needs to go towards the more vulnerable population, which is all the other taxpayers in the town of Amherst. So I would uh, seek your consideration on this and not vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is comments regarding the finances. Please come forward. As a supporter of the project, um, except I have a little issue with the rights of people that, you know, what about the rights of people who aren't you know, in an issue. I don't know if it would be possible to get some, it's part of that housing cost and inflation here is probably due to the university, as well as, you know, I wondered if some of the largest property management companies, as well as UMass, I mean, how many turnovers of apartments or how many broker fees, mm -hmm. and having applied for places, I realized that I'm going to, how many broker fees get, as well as mattresses, get turned over every semester? I mean, a million dollars, I mean, every, that's, all these apartments, would, would some of the largest property managements who cater to the students, which is most of the housing in Amherst, be willing to offset this uh, artificially inflated market by donating you know, a portion of these broker fees? And secondly, I remember a long time ago, the elementary school, I think it was Fort River, where they were s selling boards. You bought a board. I mean, if, you know, 10,000 people donated $5 or something, um, those are just out of the box type of suggestions. Um, so that, that's what I was thinking, because that's a lot of money, all those broker fees. And secondly, my other suggestion was, if the one complex that I'm talking about where it was better to live in my car than it was to live there because of the rights of people to be totally, un, you know, have no self-reflection and no self-control, is that the one guy in particular, I've been told by people who lived there for eight years, have been, been char had to have the fire department come there at least four times. Why? Because they are, get a check and they drink all day and they're not monitored. So that's four fires. The same guy admitted and bragged that he had ambulance come repeatedly times because he felt like, drinking and going out on the ice. So I'm thinking maybe if there was a, a warning, like if you, maybe if people had to have some, what's the word, a, a responsibility for their actions that they would cost the town less because they might be having to work it off. And there I will quote from Martha Stout and saying, Robert Hare writes that he believes our society is moving in the direction of permitting, reinforcing, and in some instances actually valuing some of the traits listed in blah, 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 such as impulsivity, irresponsibility, lack of remorse. So my two ideas are to stop a lot of the wasting money by anything goes, and perhaps ask some of the very profitable industries that have helped make this such a hard market be willing to uh, give back to the community because they are, they are making so much on the community. Thank you. 
And thank, thank you. you for all the people who care about making affordable housing for everybody. May thank it happen you. and I support it. We're really coming down to the last few topics and so I'm going to basically uh, ask specifically about any other comments, questions from people about anything else plus the process going forward. Seeing no comments, going once. Yes? Hi, Nicola Usher, I'm a resident of Amherst. Um, I'm gonna scratch all this because I don't wanna duplicate things that have already been said and just leave you with um, something I can't really take credit for. This was actually something my husband said to me in a conversation, but just in thinking about creating an inclusive community and what Amherst is about and welcoming people to our community, um, I would really love to see, well, first of all, I can't say with certainty, but I think based on the overwhelming support and having um, a reasonable counsel, this is probably gonna happen. Um, and so I would like to see us as a community move towards welcoming our new neighbors. And rather than talking about losing access to Pratt Field, maybe what we should be doing is partnering with Amherst College to talk about how we're gonna use Pratt Field to welcome new neighbors to our community and make them feel welcome and actually model what an inclusive community looks like. Thank you. Are there any other comments at this time? Going once? Okay. <laughs> Going twice. And we're back to the end of the agenda um, where counselors get to make any particular comments they would like to make. I just want to remind you this is not the night we're voting. Dorothy. And remember, do not push the button. I just want to thank you, Lynn, for putting together this meeting because I agree that people should talk together uh, sooner rather than later. And I agree with the, with the person who said we should have had this opportunity much earlier. I think things build up and get very bad and polarized. So I'm, I'm really hoping that out of this conversation, as you bill it, that we'll be able to move forward and to do what is appropriate, whatever that is. Any other comments from counselors at this time? Mandy Jo. I'll be quick. I want to thank everyone who sat through a meeting that lasted over four hours in order to comment and give your opinions and your thoughts and your concerns to us as we look towards making this yes. decision and vote. Thank you. Are there other comments from counselors? Um, Alyssa, do you have, feel that we have got to discuss the flag? Or has it been properly taken care of because Mr. Bockelman gave permission? It, it, it was never my flag raising. I don't care anymore. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you. This was under topics not reasonably anticipated, and it was regarding a flying of the flag for LGBT Stonewall riots on Friday, and we invite you all to join us. I want to thank everyone who has put forward the effort, the uh, presentations that you made, the comments you prepared. I do want to ask that if you have made comments tonight, and they are in writing, please send them to us so we can add them to the website where we have comments from everybody and emails from everybody and letters from everybody so that we can continue to make sure we have a fully documented set of information. You can send them to me, yes. Or you can just send them to the full town council, but I answer anyway. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Call to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Second.